and the safety of U.S. nuclear power plants was the focus of a hearing today by a House Government Reform Subcommittee. Witnesses included officials from the Homeland Security Department, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. This is about four and a half hours. This hearing entitled in Assessing Public Safety and Security Measures at Nuclear Power Facilities is called to order. The attacks of September 11, 2001 should have seared this hard truth into our national consciousness. Security is not a state of rest. It is not a static measure. Sanctuary from the terrors of the 21st century demands a new level of vigilance to protect the public from known and emerging threats. Heightened awareness of new threats and proactive countermeasures are particularly imperative to protect critical infrastructure facilities, fixed assets of enormous importance to national economic and social well-being. Of those, civilian nuclear power plants stand as highly attractive targets of terror, terrorism. Today, we ask if federal regulators are demanding the physical security and preparedness enhancements needed to protect public health and safety from nuclear terrorism. Recent reports suggest the answer may be no. Although specific to Indian Point Reactor Complex in Buchanan, New York, observations by the General Accounting Office, GAO, and a private security firm point to a systemic weakness in nuclear incident response planning that have implications for every community within 50 miles of any of the nation's 64 active reactor sites. A release of radiation caused by terrorists is a unique event, one that requires acknowledgement of the distinct factors and fears that will define the public response to such an incident. Yet the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, NRC, recently wrote, quote, necessary protective actions and off-site response are not predicated on the cause of events. I disagree. That view overstates the, re the reach of an all-hazards approach to first responder capabilities and ignores the obvious need to accommodate unique causal elements in any effective response scenario. Just as flooded roads will alter an evacuation strategy, transportation routes flooded by the spontaneous evacuation of frightened families will impede response to an attack on a nuclear plant. One dangerous element, not predicated on the cause of an incident, but certainly capable of compounding the negative effects, is poor communication between federal, state, and local officials. County, city, and town leaders wait at the far end of a dysfunctional daisy change of confusing directives from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, the NRC, and plan operators. In the event of a terrorist attack on a reactor, accurate, timely information will be local officials' most potent weapon against the panic and overreach that terrorists hope will drive property damage and loss of life. Emergency response plans and exercises have to include more accurate, more direct communication to local officials and the public. It is telling no nuclear plant license has ever been suspended or revoked due solely to weaknesses in emergency response and evacuation planning. Deficiencies can linger for years. Compliance with critical incident response and evacuation planning has been allowed to become a static, bureaucratic exercise. That has to change. If the planning requirement is to be real, not just cosmetic, reasonable assurance, assurance Reasonable assurance a plan protects public health and safety cannot be achieved through paperwork alone. It must be gained through robust exercises and measurable outcomes for which operators are held closely accountable. We appreciate the testimony of all our witnesses today, appreciate that they came to Washington to testify before this committee. 
as we continue our examination of terrorism and the protection of critical infrastructure from new threats. At this time, the chair would uh, invite Mr. Kucinich, the ranking member of this committee, to uh, make a comment. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our distinguished witnesses. Glad you could be with the committee today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your ongoing interest in the security of this country's nuclear power plants. It is certainly one of America's most critical homeland security priorities. The administration knows this. Indeed, in the 2002 State of the Union Address, the President warned that nuclear facilities could be attacked and with dire consequences. Uh, the President asserted that U.S. forces found, quote, diagrams of American nuclear power plants, unquote, in the caves of Afghanistan. On December 12th of last year, the administration was supposed to submit to Congress a report on the best way to efficiently and safely provide potassium iodide to communities surrounding nuclear power plants in the event of an attack. Potassium iodide is a very cheap, widely available tablet that can prevent fatal thyroid illnesses caused by radiation exposure. We've seen no sign of the report. We required the report because prior to September 11th, there was no comprehensive plan to buy potassium iodide and distribute it to local communities. Before 9-11, the nuclear utility industry lobbied against such measures because they feared people would become alarmed about the dangers of nuclear power. After 9-11, however, it became clear that nuclear power facilities are indeed likely targets. After 9-11, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission recommended that states consider including potassium, potassium iodide in their emergency evacuation plans. The NRC offered to buy potassium iodide so states could cover a 10-mile radius surrounding nuclear power plants. Anyone with a knowledge of past incidents, such as Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, would acknowledge that 10 miles is a very modest step. Many of us in Congress believe the NRC did not go far enough. For this reason, Congress expanded this to a 20-mile radius as part of the bill we passed last June. We also gave local governments greater flexibility to obtain pot potassium iodide when state governments failed to do so. To ensure that the administration would purchase the potassium iodide, distribute it and administer it in the most effective manner possible, we also mandated the report I described, which was to be conducted in conjunction with the National Academy of Sciences. It was due in December. Here we are three months later and still no report. Apparently, no one in the administration even allocated funding for this report until after it was due. It appears the administration hadn't even contacted contacted the National Academy of Sciences to contract for the study. It's eight months of inaction. Last week, we were told that someone in the administration finally wrote a memo to the National Academy asking them to begin work. But they're just now appointing the panelists who will begin to study this issue. How could the administration so completely ignore directive of Congress? More importantly, how could they ignore this critical issue and the families living in neighborhoods where the nuclear power plants are located? Perhaps it's because the homeland security apparatus is in disarray. Clearly, the new department is not yet operating coherently. And now that Governor Ridge has uh, left the White House, uh, President Bush has failed to appoint a successor, so nobody has assumed the responsibilities of cross-agency issues such as this one. Maybe this has just fallen through the cracks. Or maybe it's because the administration's focus is entirely on Iraq. Maybe this is just one more example of tunnel vision diverting attention away from severe threats here at home. Or perhaps the administration is relying on the industry to do the right thing, as it has in many other cases. Industry officials have stated publicly they believe nuclear power plants are over de overly defended, but an NRC review of force-on-force -force exercises demonst demonstrates precisely the opposite. NRC officials found significant weaknesses in armed responses in 37 of 81 mock attacks, or 46 percent of the time. The NRC concluded that these mock attackers would have been able to cause core damage and, in many cases, a probable radioactive release. Whatever the reason for the inaction, the administration's conduct is not acceptable. The administration promised to make homeland security a top priority. After September 11th, we cannot leave critical homeland security matters such as the safety of our nuclear power plants, to the industry. 
And we cannot let these critical items slip through the cracks or be ignored. It's important that, this, uh, that our chair has called this meeting, and I want to thank him for doing so. I think that we need to have action taken and to begin immediately. I want to thank the chair. Thank you, gentlemen. At this time, the chair would recognize the vice chair of the committee, Mr. Michael Turner. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Um, Janklow, do you have any comments? Okay, we'll do that. But uh, let me uh, welcome and ask unanimous consent that our colleague um, Sue Kelly be allowed to participate uh, in this hearing. Uh, she is uh, uh, a member of the Infrastructure Committee as well as, uh, as uh, Financial Services and is the Vice Chair of that committee, and we welcome you here. And um, she, like a number uh, in the United States, have a plant in her district and has some particular expertise in this issue. Would you like to make an opening statement, Ms. Kelly? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to express my thanks to both you and Mr. Kucinich for holding the hearing today. It addresses some issues that are on the minds of many Americans as we confront the challenges that are associated with the war on terror. The hearing addresses some matters of particular significance to many of my constituents because they live in the Indian, within the radius of the Indian Point nuclear power plants, which is in my district in Buchanan, New York. So it's a good thing the hearing will include witnesses who can speak directly to some of their concerns. The hearing is also beneficial in providing a follow-up to a hearing that we held two weeks ago in the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, which examined some of the problems with Indian Point's emergency plans and the federal government's inadequate attempts to resolve them. I said two weeks ago, and I will say again today, that FEMA has to respond to our local officials and to the issues that were recently raised by the report released by the former FEMA administrator, James Lee Witt, which concluded that the current emergency plans for Indian Point were inadequate to protect public safety. Instead of browbeating our local officials into accepting emergency plans that they're clearly uncomfortable with, FEMA needs to be addressing local officials and addressing their concerns and reassessing the impact of terrorism and the dense population that may, may have on an accident at Indian Point and it may have on the emergency plans that we need to formulate. FEMA's outdated approach to Indian Point's emergency plans has got to change. At that hearing, FEMA was given by the committee at my request a 30-day deadline to respond to those matters, and I sincerely hope they're now using that time wisely and will be able to provide answers which indicate that they are now finally taking the concerns of local officials and the WIT report seriously. Any further actions to intimidate the state and localities into rubber stamping plans that they've already refused to certify is not going to be tolerated. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for being here today, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Kucinich, for holding the hearing. I look forward to today's testimony, and thank you for allowing me to speak. We're delighted to have your participation. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Terry, I'm going to just to make a motion, then we'll allow you a chance to sit down a second, and ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record, and that the record remain open for three days. Without objection, so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all members be permitted to include their written statement in the record, and without objection, so ordered. And uh, with that in mind, I would just um, uh, point out the following individuals have submitted testimony for the record. Uh, Congresswoman Nita Lowy from New York, Congressman Elliot Engel from New York, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Mak Mak Ujani, uh, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, Linda M. Lewis, uh, emerge Emergency Management Specialist, Columbia, Maryland, and also a statement from the Project on Government Oversight referred to as POCO. Uh, at this time, we're going to just I'll call the witnesses' names. I'll swear them in, and then, Mr. Chairman, if you would like to make a statement, would welcome that. Um, we have Mr. W. Craig Conklin, Director, Techn Technological Services Division, Office of National Preparedness, Emergency Preparedness and Response Directorate, Department of Homeland Security. And we have Mr. Uh, Hubert Miller, Regional One Administrator, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, referred to as the NRC. Gentlemen, I will swear you in, and then we'll hear from Mr. Turn uh, Tierney, and then we'll uh, go to you all. If you'd uh, please stand. Raise your right hand, please. 
Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Note for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Uh, as you know, gentlemen, we swear in all our witnesses before this investigative committee. Uh, Mr. Tierney, welcome. Uh, if you have any comments, I'd love to hear them. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you for having this important hearing. Thanks to our witnesses that uh, will be testifying soon. Uh, I think we all are aware of the uh, pending hostilities that uh, potentially may erupt at any time. And as a consequence, uh, we have to be prepared for anything that might happen in this country, not the least of which is preparedness with regard to safeguarding our nuclear facilities and the material at those power plants. Uh, there are six communities in my district that fall within uh, 10 miles of a nuclear power plant in Seabrook, New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, even though we're across the border in the state, we're not that far away uh, from any uh, reaction that might occur. People in those communities are concerned and fearful uh, that we're not prepared. Uh, I've visited the Seabrook site and have gone through their, uh, their processes for testing and, and for preparedness and was not all that impressed. I think that there's plenty of room to be uh, for improvement there. I think this administration needs to really focus its attention uh, on a myriad of issues, not the least of which is the security at these facilities. And I note that last March, Secretary Abraham asked for a substantial, substantially larger amount of money than the administration um, eventually allocated uh, towards these needs for uh, protecting nuclear facilities. I also note that there was some discussion, Mr. Chairman, at some of the hearings last year about increasing the radius through which KI would be distributed, the potassium would be distributed. And I, amongst others, had recommended up to 50 miles. We eventually uh, saw that the administration proposal for 20 miles uh, carry the day, but note that even at this point in time, we don't have the report that was supposed to be out in December uh, for assuring us of how that was going to take place, and I guess we can feel less than secure that it's going to be done by the due date in June, that there's going to be a plan in place for that. So I think we have a lot of work to do. I think this is a well-timed hearing, and I look forward to the testimony and hope that we can get the answers and uh, find out that we're embarking on some more secure operations. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Um, I just would tell our witnesses that we ask you to be five minutes, but we allow you to go up to ten, but our preference is that you kind of finish closer to the five. But what you have to put on the record is more important than just five minutes. So um, we, we do the clock this way. It's a five-minute clock, and uh, then we turn it on for another five minutes. And uh, you never want to get up to ten, though. Okay. Okay. Mr. Conklin? Welcome. And we're going to have you turn on the mic. There we go. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am Craig Conklin, Director of the Technological Services Division of the Emergency Preparedness and Response Directorate of the Department of Homeland Security. My division administers FEMA's Radiological Emergency or REP program. I am pleased to be with you today to talk about the REP program and the issues relating to off-site emergency preparedness for nuclear power facilities. I will discuss the establishment of the program, federal, state, and local program responsibilities, program guidance and regulations, FEMA's revised exercise evaluation methodology, the results of the 24th, September 24th exercise, the status of the off-site plans around Indian Point, and then I will talk about the two reports uh, concerning Indian Point and Millstone that were prepared by the New York State contractor and the July 2001 GA report on Indian Point. FEMA recognizes and respects the concerns of the people of New York regarding the health and safety of those living and working in the vicinity of the Indian Point Energy Center. The health and safety of the public is our primary concern. It is FEMA's responsibility to ensure that the emergency plans in place provide reasonable assurance that the health and safety of the people around the plants can be protected. Exercises of the plans are an important component of that process as they allow participants to identify strengths and weaknesses in the plans so that corrective actions can be taken. FEMA believes that the emergency response plans must be flexible and dynamic. We expect them to be continually updated based on changing circumstances or improved procedures. For example, the plan should be updated based on the 2000 census population figures and the new evacuation time estimates that are currently being developed. In an executive order dated December 7, 1979, President Carter transferred the federal lead role in off-site radiological emergency planning and preparedness from the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, now the Emergency Response and Preparedness Directorate of, of the Department of Homeland Security. In response to this new role, FEMA established the REP program. 
It is important to note that the RUP program responsibilities encompass only off-site activities, that is, state, tribal, and local government emergency planning and preparedness activities that take place beyond the physical boundaries of the power plant. On-site activities continue to be the responsibility of the NRC. The RUP program works closely with 450 state, tribal, and local governments to ensure that there is reasonable assurance that off-site response officials can protect their citizens in the event of a nuclear power plant accident. FEMA's responsibilities are to review and evaluate off-site response plans, evaluate the exercises conducted to determine whether such plans can be implemented, make findings on the adequacies of those plans and exercises, and submit those to the NRC. We also provide radiological emergency response training to first responders and other officials. And at the national level, we chair the Federal Radiological Preparedness Coordinating Committee. At the regional level, we chair the Regional Assistance Committee, which has federal agency membership in the nine FEMA regions with power plants. Response to requests to the NRC, and of course, we provide regulatory oversight, rulemaking, and guidance as necessary for effective program implementation. State, tribal, and county responsibilities are, prepare, are to prepare plans and procedures for responding to an accident at a nuclear power plant and review them and update them annually as necessary. Conduct biennial exercises, ensure that first responders and state, tribal, and local officials are trained properly, and finally, to ensure that the response organizations, facilities, equipment, and supplies are adequate for response to a radiological incident. In 1980, we issued a jo uh, joint guidance between FEMA and NRC which establishes the basis for the REP program in a document called Criteria for Preparation and Evaluation of Radiological Emergency Response Plans and Preparedness in Support of Nuclear Power Plants. This document contains the planning standards and related criteria that we use in evaluating and reviewing off-site response organizations' plans, as well as guidance regarding on-site aspects addressed by the NRC. In 1996, we published a Federal Register notice announcing a strategic review of the REP program and requested comments on the REP program. Based on comments received, one of the major recommendations made to FEMA, made by FEMA, was to streamline the program and eliminate the exercise checklist and inconsistencies among regions. As a result, a new exercise evaluation methodology was developed that is more results-oriented and does not depend on a checklist. The September 24, 2002 exercise conducted at Energy Point was done to evaluate the off-site emergency response and NRC evaluated the on-site emergency response. The purpose of the exercise was to determine whether the off-site plans and procedures for responding to an emergency at any point could be implemented to protect the general public. Exercise participants included responders and emergency managers from Westchester, Rockland, Orange, and Putnam counties in New York, Bergen County, New Jersey, and the state of New York. The exercise scenario that was used to drive the players' actions involved a series of mechanical malfunctions that hypothetically resulted in degradation of plant operating systems and within four hours, a release of radioactive material from the plant that forced the off-site response organizations to take actions to protect the public. The specifics of this scenario and the off-site extended play were developed and agreed upon by scenario development team. This team consisted of representatives from the licensee, state and local government, the NRC and FEMA. Although we recommended several times that the exercise scenario contain a terrorism component, the other members of the team decided that such a component should not be incorporated into an exercise at this time, but should be considered for future exercises. The state and local organizations participating in the exercise demonstrated a satisfactory knowledge of the emergency response plans and procedures, their actions were implemented adequately, and there were no issues that rose to the level of a deficiency. However, evaluators did identify 13 areas requiring corrective action, corrective action during this evaluation. None of these, though, were, are raised to an issue that would have endangered the general public. Historically, we have worked closely with our state and tribal partners to ensure that public health and safety remains the focal point of the program. We will continue to do so in the, for the future. Specific to Indian Point, we have worked closely with them to prepare for the exercise as well as upgrade local plans and procedures. We have participated in and supported over 50 other activities, including meetings of out-of-sequence exercises, training opportunities, planning sessions, and other independent communications between the FEMA regional office and the state and counties. In January 2002, we provided the state and counties an extensive matrix identifying plan information that we need in order to conduct our review. However, we did not receive that information until a few weeks before the September exercise, thus limiting our ability to thoroughly evaluate these plans for consistency with our regulations. In recognition of the constraints and limitations on the state and local governments, we proceeded with the exercise with the understanding we would complete this review after the exercise. And in November 2002, we had such a meeting with the state and established a May 2003 timeframe for completion of state and county plan updates 
that would permit inclusion of this critical evacuation time estimates into the process. In February 2003, we provided the state and counties opportunity to submit the updated plans as previously agreed upon. If the state and county submit the information before this date, FEMA will evaluate it and then decide if we can make a determination of reasonable assurance. This deadline provides FEMA an opportunity to review the final state report that is due shortly and the state plan for distribution of KI that was submitted in February 28, 2003. The most significant remaining issues include the letters of agreement, um, the updated evacuation time estimate studies, the joint news center procedures, school district, preschool, daycare center plans for the children. Two reports on Indian Point, um, the review of the emergency preparedness at Indian Point and Millstone um, issued uh, on, that was recently finalized, I believe the uh, appendix came out today, uh, validated our findings, especially those specifically identified under January 2002 and December 3rd, 2002 and February 21st correspondence. Examples of value information contained in the report include an improved public outreach effort should be used to better educate all sectors of the public on their role. FEMA should develop an outcome-based exercise program for exercise evaluation, and we have developed such an approach and it was used in the exercise. However, the report may contain information that will help us better attain this goal. And planning must account for the strong possibility of spontaneous evacuation. FEMA is committed to continuous improvement of the RAP program and will evaluate each recommendation in the report to determine its validity with regard to the level of emergency preparedness at Indian Point or its applicability program-wide. FEMA is looking forward to evaluating the final report that came out today. The GAO report in 2000, and 2000 um, and, uh, was a result of a steam generator uh, tube rupture accident at Indian Point. Uh, the, the GAO report included suggestions um, for improving the program and concluded that some improvements had been made to the lessons to the lessons learned since the accidents, but further improvement was needed. The final report was published in 2001. There are several recommendations I'd please be discussed with you. The report concluded overall that the director of FEMA determined the reasons why the four counties responsible for the response at the plant are not knowledgeable about FEMA's initiatives and if necessary reassess its current practices of communicating through the state during non-emergency situations. After completion of the report, FEMA responded to the recommendations by communicating with the counties and states simultaneously and as detailed in my written testimony, greatly increased communications with the four risk counties. In conclusion, the REP program is committed to diligent support of the efforts of the state and local governments to improve the REP planning and exercise process. Again, I would like to thank you, Chairman Shays and Representative Kucinich, for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Conklin. Mr. Miller, you don't have to read as fast. <laughs> Slow down. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. It is a pleasure to appear before you today to discuss NRC actions with respect to security and emergency preparedness at nuclear power facilities. Security and emergency preparedness are key elements of the defense in depth, depth safety philosophy NRC has long employed in regulating nuclear power plants. This philosophy, which requires uh, redundancy of safety systems to reduce the potential for accidents imposes high standards of quality on operations and construction of plants, recognizes that accidents can still occur. For this reason, containment structures and other safety features are required to minimize the potential for release of radioactivity from a site. Through emergency planning, additional mechanisms are put in place to protect the public in the unlikely event these barriers fail. Security of nuclear power plants has been given top priority at NRC since the September 2001 terrorist attack. Within minutes of the attack, NRC directed plants across the country to go to the highest level of security. While for many years all nuclear power plants have been required to have security programs sufficient to defend against violent assaults by well-armed, well-trained attackers, numerous additional steps have been taken since September 2001 to thwart terrorist acts. Through formal orders, NRC has required increased security posts and patrols, 
substantial additional physical barriers and greater standoff distances for vehicle bombs, stricter site access controls, to name only a few of these measures. Through inspections, we have been able to confirm that required security enhancements are being implemented at all plants. Mr. Miller, I'm going to just have you move the mic just about an inch back further. Usually I have to tell people to move it closer, but we're getting, just move it away. Yeah, thanks. We have recently begun enhanced force on force exercises. In fact, in, expect that Indian, the Indian Point facility to be among the first involved in this initiative. Working with the Department of Homeland Security, other federal agencies, and the intelligence community, we have continued comprehensive assessment of security programs. Among other things, evaluating the current threat environment and addressing issues such as security guard fatigue and training, which have emerged since 9-11. For many years, NRC has made legislative proposals addressing a wide spectrum of activities that would further enhance security of NRC licensed activities. We will continue to work with, Cong with Congress and look forward to favorable action on these proposals. Let me now turn to emergency planning. Following the accident at Three Mile Island, the NRC determined that improved emergency planning by federal, state, and local governments was needed. NRC issued planning standards which required, among other things, establishing uh, the establishment of two emergency planning zones around each nuclear plant site. The first is a zone covering an area of about 10 miles in all directions from a plant where the greatest potential for radiological effects from a release exists. Plans must address protective actions for members of the public in this zone which could involve evacuation or sheltering. A second extended planning zone of about 50 miles is also established to deal with potential lower level long term risks associated principally with contamination of food and water that might occur. Emergency planning is a dynamic process. Plans are tested in frequent drills and periodic full scale exercises that simulate serious reactor accidents. Having lead at the federal level uh, for reviewing offsite preparedness, FEMA periodically assesses these plans and exercises. If at any time FEMA finds offsite preparedness is not adequate, it will inform the governor of the state and the NRC. The NRC will then work with FEMA, the state, plant operator, and other stakeholders to address identified deficiencies. While we are not at this point in the process regarding Indian Point, we are, of course, familiar with the issues recently raised by Mr. Witt's report, as well as other issues raised by FEMA. And we will closely monitor steps being taken in the coming months by FEMA, the state and counties to address these concerns. One of the issues raised in the Witt report involved emergency preparedness following a terrorist attack. Emergency plans are intentionally broad and flexible to assure a wide, wide spectrum of events, including those involving rapid, large releases of radioactivity, can be responded to effectively. Plan resp responses are not predicated on the specific cause or probability of an event. Rather, emergency planning assumes the improbable has occurred and develops a response to address the consequences of potential releases whether releases occur as a result of terrorist acts or equipment malfunctions, emergency plans provide an effective framework for decision making and response. Effective communications with stakeholders is an important element of all of our regulatory activities. For example, over the past several years, we have conducted numerous meetings near Indian Point to inform the public and seek views on the heightened oversight we have been providing that facility. Addressing the desire of local officials to more frequently and directly communicate with NRC on emergency preparedness as reflected in a GAO study on Indian Point in 2001, 
we stepped up our interactions with county emergency preparedness professionals. We have supported workshops, meetings, and other activities, activities addressing emergency planning issues such as pota potassium iodide use, dose assessment, and the like. We will continue these efforts, particularly in light of the current situation where important specific issues have been raised. Mr. Chairman, I have discussed the many steps NRC has taken to strengthen security and address emergency preparedness issues which have emerged since the 9-11 attacks, steps taken to communicate with stakeholders on these important issues. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to call on Mr. Turner to start us off, then go to Mr. Uh, Tierney, and then to Mr. Janklow, and then to our uh, colleague, um, Ms. Kelly, and then I'll have questions. But I'm going to just tell you the two questions, Mr. Conklin, I want you to think about, okay? And one is, uh, what in the WIT report recommendations validated FEMA's emergency preparedness findings? And I'm also going to ask, and this is more important to me, I'm taking this out of a letter that was addressed to me on February 12th from the NRC. And the question is, does FEMA agree with the NRC that the WIT report gives, quote, undue weight, end of quote, to potential terrorist attacks? Um, I'm going to ask your opinion about that after others have gone. And so at this time, Mr. Turner, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your presentation today and the information that you're providing us. I think we all know the importance of the issue of, of preparedness, not only for the issue of an emergency response, but in advance in looking at the types of threats uh, that, that uh, these facilities uh, may face. Uh, one thing's for certain in looking at the information that we have received uh, concerning possible terrorist threats to the United States, uh, we can't say that we don't know that nuclear power plants may be a target. The information that we have indicates that, in fact, um, they, they have been uh, viewed as possible targets uh, by terrorists. Um, and, and also, knowing the issue of, of the occurrence of September 11th, we know that our need for preparedness is very high because we can't, we can no longer say that, that it won't happen here. And looking at the, the issues of, of your statements, um, one of the con considerations that I'd like to, to hear from Mr. Miller, when you're talking about issues of prevention, um, largely in your testimony I heard uh, statements about an attack that might occur, uh, perhaps um, a paramilitary or guerrilla type or terrorist attack, uh, but not necessarily issues of what type of security enhancements or issues are you looking at for prevention that might in include you know, civil reengineering of facilities to look at more catastrophic attacks um, like we saw on, on September 11th. From uh, in the few days, in the days immediately following the um, September attacks, in addition to requiring that the security level at all plants be raised to the highest level, the Commission chartered studies to look at the potential effects of, uh, uh, of attacks on the plant. We have conducted vulnerability assessments over this past several years. Those are um, assessments that take some time to complete. And in those assessments that have been done, and I cannot provide uh, you know, details here, but uh, we have not identified uh, anything beyond the steps that we have ordered the plants to take, which are clearly needed. To, uh, to address um, extreme events. Um, I think it is significant that we have issued um, orders which have required significant uh, increase in patrols and, and uh, the strengthening of the physical barriers at the plant where that's needed. Um, we continue this assessment working with the um, with the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense intelligence community. We continue our assessment of the threat environment. If at any time in these studies we determine that more is needed beyond what we have already required, we will take steps. Well, I, I guess just in listening to your testimony and in testimony that we've heard in previous hearings be before this subcommittee, I think there are serious concerns about the vulnerability of plants, and I would hope that your process is not one that you view as complete, uh, but ongoing, and that there 
there are issues uh, that people are openly discussing that, that need to be addressed, and we'd certainly hope that you would be looking to address them. In looking at your written testimony, uh, I was also slightly concerned that uh, you indicate that, and I'll just read this paragraph, it says, it's not likely that protective actions would need to be taken for the entire 10-mile emergency planning zone, even for a significant release. A radioactive plume from a nuclear plant does not move in all directions at once, but travels in the general direction to which the wind is blowing. As a result, only a small fraction of the population in the emergency planning zone would be in the pathway of the plume. Uh, I doubt that the um, population within the area of an emergency would feel the same way as that paragraph is written, uh, that their risk of and a need of evacuation is minimal. Um, could, could you comment on that in your planning with respect to the, the fact that um, you're not likely to be able to just evacuate slices of an overall pie? Um, what we're speaking to in that, in that um, part of the testimony is what is required. If you look at releases from the plant and if you look at the uh, weather conditions and the like and the direction of the, uh, the travel of any radioactive plume, uh, the, um, it's, it's pretty clear that the, the, the uh, areas that, are, that must necessarily be evacuated are in uh, a direction that uh, corresponds with the direction the wind is blowing. And now I recognize that people outside that zone might on their own accord, uh, you know, choose to, uh, um, to, some may choose to evacuate, but what we're speaking to there is just the, you know, a physical uh, reality that uh, a plume will go in a certain direction. And the assessment that is done by the offsite officials is in fact of what the weather conditions are. Where are the areas that are uh, potentially uh, uh, exposed uh, to uh, radioactivity, and it's, it's those areas that are targeted and given priority in any evacuation. And uh, in most instances, you will not necessarily, you will not need to uh, evacuate a whole 10-mile area to, um, to, protect, to protect the public. Now, it's a normal process. Uh, if there is uncertainty, um, a, a standard approach is to evacuate within two miles in all directions and five miles downwind as a, as a default position if there's uncertainty. But um, th the point is that uh, it is not necessary in all cases to evacuate the full 10 miles. Mr. Cherney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Miller, I'd like to explore with you a little bit uh, on the licensing or relicensing process here. I'd like to understand it a little bit better if I could. In determining the level of the security that, uh, that these establishments need, my understanding is that first the National Regulatory Commission promulgates the design basis threat. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And as I understand it, the current design basis threat requires protection against a small group of skilled and well-armed outsiders aided by one insider a single insider acting alone, and a four-wheel drive land vehicle bomb. Did I get that correct? Well, I won't comment on the specific attributes of the current design basis threat. Because? Uh, it's sensitive information, but it does involve a violent attack uh, by well-trained, well-armed attackers, and it does involve a vehicle bomb, but I need to hasten to, I need to point out that the steps that we uh, required be taken in the, or, in the order that we issued, raise the level of security at these plants that goes well beyond the current pre-9-11 design basis threat. Right, let me break it down a little bit. First of all, you said they're sensitive. Are they classified? It's, it's sensitive information that uh, is, is not classified, but it is what we call safeguards information, is sensitive information, the specific attributes. The broad definition of what the design basis threat is contained in our regulations, and it is what I have just described. All right, well, do me a favor, do, give it to me again, because it, might, it was before September 11th, at least, the way I described it, am I right? The, the, the details 11, I can't confirm, but in, in concept, it is, it is this violent attack by, by uh, well-trained, well-armed attackers. And one insider. And uh, aided by an insider. Right. Another aspect of that was a single insider acting alone. You had provisions to deal with, with no outsiders with somebody on the inside. Again, I want to be careful about the specifics, but in concept, it is, a, uh, it is an insider. 
and, and this, is what, this is among the things that I talked about earlier, what, what we are examining and what the Commission is right now engaged in looking at in, in examining the current threat environment along with, in concert with the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, and the intelligence community to determine what is the proper current design basis threat. And I guess but, what I'm trying to get, Mr. Miller, is, is where are we in that process? Have you formally changed it from what it was before September 11, 2001, or are you still in the exploratory stages of trying to determine just what it will be? Within the next several months, we expect to issue new requirements in this respect. So there have been no but new requirements, important. excuse me, there, there have been no new requirements issued since September 11, 2001 up to this point in time. Is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is that we have issued new requirements. Right. There are prescriptive requirements. We knew it would take some time to work and coordinate with the Defense Department, the intelligence community, and so on to pin down the, 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 the uh, precisely what the current threat is. But we didn't, we knew we couldn't wait. And that's why we uh, raised the bar. That's why we, we stipulated or, or required that plants uh, upgrade security to a level that's beyond, well beyond what existed under the old design basis threat prior to 9-11. Yeah. And when did those new uh, provisions go into effect? They have been in effect. They were issued in an order. Uh, the order was issued in February of last year. So February 2002. February 2002. That followed actually a series of threat advisories that we issued on a very immediate basis to raise the level of security at the plants. And every one of the plants across the country is now required to meet All those All of the plants were criteria. required to come into conformance with that last August. We've done inspections to confirm that, that, those, uh, that those enhancements had been put in place. Now, what was the process that you used in determining that new design basis threat? Did you consider the likelihood of, a, of an event or the potential severity? Is that the, uh, the process that you went through? Uh, it was, there was a very systematic review of the potential vulnerabilities of the plants, and uh, that order was uh, uh, developed, in fact, uh, considering the kinds of uh, attacks that could be made on the plant and the, the, the areas that needed to be strengthened. It was already at a very high level, and it was strengthened uh, uh, following that order. In December of last year, the uh, Commission indicated in one of its decisions that it doesn't consider the impacts of terrorism when making a licensing decision. Is that still the case? I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Let me just. You want this individual to swear himself in? Do you want me to swim in? Do you want me to answer? It depends on who's going to answer. What does Judy has to say? I'm not an attorney, and I'm not the, the specialist in this area. So what I would prefer to do is to, uh, if, it, uh, if you'll indulge me, provide an answer unless uh, my let me, let me attorney. Let me just ask you, the gentleman speaking yeah, to you is. This is a. Uh, Why don't we swear you in? Come yeah, in. this is Mr. Chandler. He is uh, from our Office of General Counsel. Mr. Mr. Chandler, if you raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give before the subcommittee is the truth, both truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please have a seat. I, it's my fault. I should have said if anyone might likely respond, they should have stood in the back and raised their right hand. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me just have you uh, give your full title and if you could give a card to the transcriber. I will. My name is Lawrence Chandler. I'm Associate General Counsel for Hearings, Enforcement, and Administration thank you. at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Thank you. Feel free to respond to the question. Thank uh, you. Let me just state it again so that uh, I sure. make sure that you have a fair opportunity on that. My question was that when the uh, NRC is issuing an order well, when it's making a decision about licensing, do you take into consideration uh, the impacts of terrorism and, and the readiness of that particular facility to deal with terrorism? The Commission's decisions uh, last December focused, focused on uh, the issues that were presented by various parties in several different proceedings. The Commission's decision basically concluded that it was not necessary in the context of NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, to consider the acts of terrorism. It also reiterated that acts of enemies of the United States were beyond the scope of the requirements uh, under the Commission's regulations. So and I understand the decision in, in December was more along environmental issues than anything else, but it was a sweeping statement, I think, that was made in those decisions. And so what I'm getting from you is that you're, you're saying that the NRC does not feel that in making licensing decisions that it should take into consideration a facility's preparedness to deal with terrorist situations. 
beyond the scope of those requirements set out in 10 CFR Part 73, which is, our, which is the basic safeguards and physical protection requirements. Again, well, it was the acts uh, of uh, enemies of the United States that were raised in the context of the issues before the Commission, as well as the specific context of consideration in, uh, for NEPA purposes that the Commission responded to. Follow up on that, Mr. Chairman. Can you tell me then what exactly in the, in the area of terrorism or preparedness to deal with terrorism, what, if anything, is considered by the Commission when it deals with licensure? Well, I think if you look at the terms that you were describing, uh, again, in, in your question of Mr. Miller a moment ago with respect to the design basis threat, uh, there are elements of that that I think you would fairly characterize as including aspects of terrorism. And it's, you, you must meet those or meet the ability to deal with those? Again, that's part of the design basis threat. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have a second pass at this witness, uh, these witnesses. Um, Mr. Janklow, Governor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, as I, as I read your testimony, gentlemen, I, I, I'm a little bit puzzled. I, as I've listened to and read the f Mr. Conklin's testimony, it, it appears that, and people are talking about Indian Point a lot, um, it, it appears letters of agreement have been submitted, but they haven't been finalized. It appears that uh, the, as, as to evacuations, the plans don't yet incorporate data from the updated evacuation time estimate studies that reflect the new demographics as well as the shadow evacuation. It appears that the joint news conference procedures really don't work very well, but they're working on upgrading them. It, uh, it appears that the procedures for the schools in the county are adequate, but that the individual school districts, preschool and daycare centers haven't yet submitted for FEMA review uh, for consistency and completeness. Sir, what's the problem? What's, what's holding it all up from being done from your perspective? In just a couple sentences, whose fault is it? Well, the responsibility for, for providing that information rests with the state and county folks working together to forward that information on to FEMA. Is this a is this a turf battle of some type, or is it an ego battle, or is it, uh, don't they have the resources, or isn't it important, or what's the reason it hasn't been submitted? I, you would really have to talk to the, the state folks to really get the reasons. Um, I, have, have you folks ever talked to them and asked oh, them? Oh, yes, we have. And had what do they tell you is the reason? Um, in, in our discussions we've had, it's, it's been a resource problem for them because of the number of plants in the state, the number of- Because of what, sir? The number of nuclear plants in the state, the, num the amount of preparedness activities that they do, part do undertake in the areas around those nuclear plants. Okay, and if they say it's a resource problem because of the number of nuclear plants, how do we fix the problem? What do we do to fix the problem? Or do we ask the terrorists to wait until we can get more resources? The, it, the provision of, uh, of resources would fix, could help the problem. The, historically, in the, in the REP program, and I'm speaking program-wide now, the resources that come to the county and local officials, and in some, kind, in some cases the states, come from the licensee. They help out with the off-site planning and, and actually will fund some of the activities in those off-site areas. M Mr. Miller, you talk about doing these mock exercises, uh, and I realize you can't, you can't really use much of an element of surprise when you're trying to surprise people that are armed. Uh, you could run into problems, but, you know, on a chalkboard, when you put up X's and O's, all plays score touchdowns. Things work on the board. In reality, how often have your mock exercises determined that what it is that you were doing in terms of, uh, of, of defensive preparedness, were what percent of the time aren't the defenses effective? I can't give you a figure off the top of my head, but I, I do want to comment on one thing folks talk about or people talk about failures. I think it's important to understand that these are mock assaults that are uh, commando style uh, attacks on the plant the uh, attacking uh, the adversary team has intimate knowledge of the vital equipment in the plant and the various features of the security program. So it's, 
they're given very strong advantage in these, in these assaults. And the purpose is to identify those areas of potential weakness, areas where the plan can be strengthened. Um, I think the notion that these um, exercises as they're performed reveal a fundamental flaw and a fundamental problem with the security program is, uh, is I think, misleading. Um, in all of these instances, uh, immediate steps are taken to address any areas or to, to strengthen the areas that are identified. And, and sir, how do you very mock, aggressive. excuse me, how, how do you mock exercise flying an, an airplane into the facility? Um, we don't simulate that. Isn't, well, how, do you, how would you deal with it? Are, are these plants capable of, As, me, are these plants capable of dealing with that type of attack? As I mentioned earlier, we have been conducting and are still conducting uh, assessments of uh, um, extreme events such as that, and uh, we have not uh, completed those studies, but we are aware of what the preliminary indications are, and they they, as we said in our testimony, indicate that the current planning basis uh, is um, still intact. I mean, that the, that the uh, assumptions of emergency planning uh, have not been shown to be uh, flawed or need, a need of change as a result of these studies we've done. How many plants do we have in the United States, sir? I believe there are 103. Of those, have you been units. able to determine yet what, what number of those would be able to withstand the, the, the flight of an airplane, uh, a, a suicide mission into the plant? We're, we're doing those reviews. I think that it, it's clear that these plants were not designed specifically to withstand uh, an attack by a modern day commercial jetliner, but they were designed to withstand uh, very extreme events, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, uh, you know, missiles that can be thrown at a, at a, at a plant by, by a tornado, very extreme events. They're not soft targets. They're hardened structures. And it's our belief that, uh, you know, that, that the, um, there is reasonable assurance. But well, let me ask mm -hmm. you this, sir. How, is there, if, if I'm a, if I, if I had children or my grandchildren live within five, six miles of a plant downwind on a given day, how much reason would I have to be concerned that something like, a, forget an airliner, let's say a G4, G5, Falcon 50 type aircraft were to be deliberately flown into the facility at uh, five or 600 miles an hour head on by a suicide mission? Uh, what, how From much what concern I should I have? From what I understand studies, they indicate that these, uh, these facilities are hardened sufficiently to, uh, to resist uh, attacks uh, of that sort. Uh, we're still looking at this, and as I said before, um, we have not identified anything that would require us to change our planning, our planning basis. What and it doesn't say anything about the prevention that, that exists with respect to uh, making the skies more secure more through FAA and the steps that are being taken there. One more question, sir. Thank you. And I appreciate you both being very responsive. Mr. Miller and, and, and Mr. Conklin, how long will it be? until your assessments are done, Mr. Miller, and how long will it be, Mr. Conklin, until you're satisfied that all the communities that need to submit their plans so that they could be implemented if necessary will be done? Well, if you're talking about the assessments that are being done right now in connection with the specific issues raised by the WIT report and by, by FEMA, that's a process that, that uh, FEMA has to lead on and, and it has engaged with the state. And uh, our role is to, uh, is to monitor that process. And if it comes to an impasse, if it, if it does come to an impasse, then it would come to, to the NRC. But we have not, we have not uh, we're, at this point, we're still monitoring the process. And at this point, it's still FEMA's I, lead. I, th I think I better just kind of move along here and then we'll have, uh, would you have a quick answer, Mr. Con Conklin? I would just say that right now it, it's, it's too difficult to tell. We gave them a May 2nd deadline to get the information in, and, and if they get it in, we will review it and then move on from there based on what is in the information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I call in Ms. Kelly, I just make the observation that we have problems in some cases with the plans, but the one challenge that I think a lot of people have is the people who need to see these plans, the public don't. 
They're not aware of these plans. And they're the ones ultimately that are impacted by it. Um, Ms. Kelly, you have the floor. Again, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Conklin, you mentioned May 2nd. Um, a, f a few, two weeks ago, I asked FEMA and gave them a 30-day deadline to work with our local officials, and I'd like to know what FEMA has done to comply with the request by the report, uh, for a report, by the end of this month on your, your uh, agency's uh, efforts to respond to the local concerns and the, with the lo work with the local officials you had until you, I gave you until the end of this month. Yes, ma'am. And we are hard at work on that. Uh, Joe Picciano, who uh, was at the, the last hearing, has uh, written to the uh, states and asked them, or asked to the state of New York, and asked for uh, meetings and activities to sit down with them and the local officials to work through the information. We have uh, drafted a reply to your request and are working that through the system to get you a timely reply. But we're working very diligently with the state and the county folks right now to address these issues. As you know, the WIT report was finalized last week, and the primary conclusions in the WIT report have not changed since the draft was released in January. What have you done specifically to address the additional comments that the WIT report uh, spoke about with the impact of a terror that a terrorist attack could have on your emergency plans? I have not had a chance myself to review that report. My understanding is it came out either Friday or today. It's about a 68-page addendum to the existing report. Um, there, were some, there were some minor changes made to it, but I have not had a chance to look at the overall report to see if there's been any changes to the major findings yet. So I'd like to get back to you if I could, because right now I haven't seen the final report myself to evaluate it in detail. So the answer is, so far as you know, nothing. FEMA's done nothing. Not with the final part. We have looked at the, uh, the draft report and incorporated that into our state um, exercise, into our exercise report and cross-referenced the findings that the WIT report had in it with findings that we had developed through our plan reviews and exercise reviews. And um, we've gone that far. And have we're looking at it from a, a national program perspective. Have you done anything about the comment in the WIT report that speaks of the fact that high population areas require different, have, have different requirements on an evacuation plan than otherwise? I have asked a contractor to look at the literature and the science and the social sciences behind those kinds of activities to, to see what we can find in the literature that would support the, those kinds of comments and then what we would or should do to take and address those in our plans and procedures and our guidance. Mr. Conklin, FEMA does a great job in many instances with natural disasters. The concern of my constituency, and I'm sure that the chairman's constituencies have the same problems, this could, there could be, this could not perhaps be a natural disaster. I wonder if you'd please, please detail the internal process that your agency goes through to determine that in an emergency plan provides reasonable assurance to those of us who live quite close to these plants that our, our health and our safety are protected. It's my understanding that determination is made by the region and then is sent up to the headquarters. Is that accurate? That is accurate. There is a regional assistance committee in our nine regions that have nuclear power plants in it. When these plans are reviewed, they're reviewed by more than just FEMA. They're reviewed by folks from the NRC, the Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Health and Human Services, and a number of other federal departments and agencies. So we look at these plans and procedures in great detail at the regional level, figuring that those folks on the, on the Regional Assistance Committee are closer to the state and locals there so that if they have questions, they can then go back and talk with them about the plans and any issues they may identify. Once they have finished their review, they, they generate a report and that comes to headquarters for us to then look at and ask any further questions. And then based on that, we come to a determination. One of the th things that you brought up in your testimony was a discussion about the communications that uh, occur between the plant, the local officials, and the county, of the surrounding county officials. Uh, I have some great concern about that because that was pointed out to be a problem 
in the area of the Indian Point and Millstone plants. Do you want to address anything? Have you done anything uh, within the framework that I'm requiring of you, re with the 30-day framework that I am requiring of you, have you done anything to address that problem, the problems of communication between each other, these different areas? It's my understanding that following the GAO report, which had a recommendation for improving communications between the federal officials and the county officials, that site um, points of contacts were established in the region to deal specifically with those county folks around those plants, and that, and, and that since then, the um, FEMA folks met with county folks with the state folks. They set up a, I don't think it was a written agreement, but they set up an agreement whereby <clears throat> they would work together and meet together as a group versus going FEMA to state, state to the county, and that kind of thing. So it's my understanding, that, and this happened prior to me coming on board, so it's my understanding that they've worked out that issue and the communications have been in, increased and improved. They may have been improved, Mr. Conklin, but I still understand from my first responders that their radio capability is the police can't speak on the same frequency as the fire people. The fire people can't speak on the same frequency as some of the people at the county level. And I know that this is a problem throughout the United States. It's not just my nuclear plants, mm -hmm. it's other nuclear plants. Is FEMA addressing the problems that we are having with allowing these first responders to any emergency to be able to talk with each other? I understand it's so bad in some areas, and especially with the World Trade Center, that the, some of the people down on the ground trying to direct people up in the towers didn't have the right radio frequencies for those particular companies that were up in the towers. That needs to be addressed. Are you doing something? Yes, there is, and I'm not, I have not been involved in that process. There is a interoperability assessment board, an IAB, I think that's the right title for it, that is looking at this issue nationwide, not only for the power plants, but for any responses, whether it's hurricanes, tornadoes. It's a nationwide effort. Um, and it's, uh, it's been going on for, for about a year, if I, if I remember properly. Mr. Conklin, I would like you to include something to that, to, to address that question in the 30-day report. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, in the next round, I think we'll probably have to go 10-minute round, and I apologize to the panels that will follow. Um, I, I'm doing a little wrestling here uh, ab about <laughs> getting by the NRC, somehow making the assumption that if it's a nuclear attack on a plant, that it, the consequences are no different than any kind of release. And Mr. Miller, you got to walk me through the logic there. One of the things you said in your remarks, which I think is a very fair question, uh, relates to the impact off-site of a terrorist attack. In our comments, the comments that you referred to, we have been focusing on the part that we're responsible for, which is the safety of the reactor and how the reactor would respond we are focused on the securing of the plant itself. I think it is a fair question to ask what impact a terrorist attack would have on um, protective measures that may be taken off-site. This is FEMA's uh, area, of course. It's, it's their lead. Uh, I would expect that uh, there would be discussion on this as these uh, Plans are worked out, when, not only in the Indian Point case, but in other cases. When we so wrote, we, we were not intending in our comments to speak really to this off-site uh, aspect. Yeah, but, but with all due respect, when, when we wrote you, a, when we wrote um, the NRC a letter in January um, expressing concern about the WIT report, in one paragraph uh, from the, the chairman of the NRC, he says, while we appreciate and recognize the effort that went into the draft report, we believe the draft report appears to give undue weight to the impact of potential acts of terrorism on emergency planning and preparedness. And further down it says, necessary protective actions and off-site response are not predicated, off-site response are not predicated on the cause of events. Whether releases from the plan occur as a result of a terrorist attacks or equipment malfunction, emergency plans guide decision makers and responders in the same way. I just think that's blatantly untrue. That comment is based on uh, the fact that uh, no accident 
is going to follow a script. And so emergency plans have to be broad and flexible. They have to be designed to deal with uh, a whole spectrum of things that can occur. Uh, it's a performance-based uh, approach. I, I, I understand and, you're and, saying. And so, our, with, so that, that comment is irrelevant. And very much based on what we know has been done to secure the plants. Mr. Miller, do you believe it is relevant to say that a terrorist attack has no other, no different consequence than any other type of attack? Do you think that that implication makes sense to you? I think with respect to the plant itself, the thing that we're talking about, which is the potential for uh, disruption of the reactor and the reactor core, cooling of the core, and release of radioactivity, our approach in emergency preparedness has always been to be aggressive uh, in the way emergency planning is done. So we have always required uh, there be large releases of radioactivity that developed uh, you know, within a short time. And the, the, the plans have always been geared towards large releases. Yeah, yeah, so in that sense, we, we believe that it doesn't make a difference um, as far as what happens on site. You know, I, I think the, the better answer would have been that there obviously is a difference, and um, we're looking at it. And to say anything other than that scares the hell out of me, because you guys are in charge. And I, we've had four years of hearings about what terrorists can do and how they can do it. And um, frankly, it, it, it defies my sense of logic, your answer. I, I realize your chairman said it, and I'm putting you in an awkward circumstance, but I, I would have loved something. Well, may I say, Mr. Chairman, I, and I've been in numerous meetings since we issued that letter, and what I sense is that people understand the NRC to be downplaying somehow the I just the, the, the downplaying the effects of terrorism or the potential for terrorism, and in fact, no, it's in, not in, just the potential, but that the a, a terrorist attack has a different impact. It it can can result in things that we never anticipated before. And uh, for instance, even your reference to hardened sites. What is a hardened site? What is in that hardened site that well, is protected? What we're referring to is. First of all, the containment structure itself. I mean, these right. are structures that have to be designed to withstand very significant uh, external uh, right. impacts, uh, you know, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, if you will. Uh, right, but what is in that site? It's, the, it's, it's basically the, the nuclear operation, right. uh, the, the fuel itself, and so on. But it is a fact, terrorists know this, that the operations aren't necessarily, the control panels aren't necessarily inside. The, this, the ability to, to uh, uh, your command structure is not necessarily in a hardened site throughout the country. Isn't that true? Well, Mr. Chairman, this is why our requirements have always been for the plants to be defended against off, violent off, attacks, and off, that's all been strengthened since off, the... First off, I just need an answer to the question, and then you can tell me all the other things. The implication that somehow the control panels and so on would be in hardened sites is not accurate. Is that true? They aren't under hardened sites. Is that correct? They're not hardened uh, in the sense that they're specifically designed for, you know, airplane crashes and the, and, and the like. Thank you. But having said that, I mean, they, because of the necessity for these to be designed to withstand these many other phenomena, they're not soft targets. And I think it's, it, it's important for the public to, to, to recognize this, because I think without an, this understanding, there is a, a great deal of concern that can, well, can my, arise. My, my time's are out. We're going to do 10 minutes the second time through. I'm just going to say to you, Mr. Miller, I, we just scratching the surface here. But your, the way you're answering your questions is, um, it gives me the feeling that we're continuing to do something in this country that I deeply regret. The terrorists know how vulnerable sites are, whether they're chemical sites, nuclear sites, or whatever. They know. They know what to do. These are not people who are just going to blithely walk up and try something. They plan it out. They know where they're vulnerable. And so when we discuss these issues, 
The only thing we're keeping it from is the American people. The terrorists already know. They already know that when you use the term hardened sites, that's the concept that we have really protected that, that the plant, the, where the nuclear fuel is, and so on. But the terrorists know that the operations aren't hardened as you use that term. We try to protect them, but they are clearly uh, going to have impact if they choose something different than un that's under the cone. And I guess I just regret that we can't have an open conversation here. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, in all due respect, the, the, the reason why I pointed this out is that I, I would not want the public to believe that this is business as usual since 9-11. I mean, enormous steps well, have been taken to strengthen these, the security yeah, of these plants. That's different, and that's an honest <laughs> answer. We are making and taking a lot of steps, but, but they remain significantly vulnerable to terrorist attacks. That's the reality. And maybe in a few years they won't, but right now they are. And that's why our talking about an evacuation plan even has more significance. And I just would ask you, Mr. Miller, tell me uh, the number of times the NRC has basically suspended the operation of a plant because we haven't liked the evacuation plan. I don't believe we've done that. Yeah, but if the conditions exist that that is called for, we will. Well, my logic, again, is there has had to been some time during the course of our history where the plans weren't really that good. And we probably should have, you know, temporarily suspended the plan. And we didn't, which makes me a little leery. I, I believe in the case of Turkey Point several years ago, after one of the hurricanes, there was a period where a plant, where the plant was shut down. Uh, the, the company chose to do it, uh, but uh, we uh, yeah, well, felt it was important company. to take that step because there was a question about emergency preparedness. Well, here, uh, we're going to go back to Mr. Turner. Uh, uh, we're going to go Mr. Turner and then Mr. Cherney for 10. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just start. Uh, I want to join with you in, in your concern with the, the language that we're hearing uh, today because it, it is um, obviously being a new member of the committee and the limited number of hearings that we have heard on this issue. Um, I can tell you, Mr. Miller, that we have heard previous to your testimony that the FAA rules may not be um, enough to prevent a second attack, uh, that the nuclear f uh, plants in this country uh, may be structurally vulnerable. And what I hear from you, if, if I was asked when I leave here by my constituents what your testimony was, is that we're still conducting a review we're still looking at this issue, but so far we've not seen anything to change our planning. And to look at your written testimony, the extent in which I would characterize your planning as to be totally evacuation focused, you also reference the FAA rules as being something that might stop the occurrence of this type of an attack. It's of a concern to me because it sounds as if people who are testifying before this committee prior to your attendance today, are recognizing a greater need for action from your agency than perhaps your agency is recognizing. If indeed that with what you see today, there is no change in your planning process and it is totally focused to evacuation, um, I, I would join with the chairman in, in my concern that the public has, has probably significant concerns that the that your agency needs to begin to look at the obvious, which is we know that you are vulnerable, uh, that our plants are vulnerable, and that there has to be some actions that can be taken besides just looking at issues of how do we get the public out of the way. I'm not going to sit here, and nobody can sit here and give you absolute assurances that there's no risk. I mean, I'm not saying that. But if I were a member of the public, I would be concerned if it were couched the way you phrased it, which is and that, that's that we, I've heard it. That's why uh, I asked. of plan of we're not doing any planning. I have to repeat myself. There are the numerous steps that have been taken. The the strengthening of the security forces, the kinds of weapons that are employed, the uh, the incredible increase in the um, uh, the um, site access requirements at the plants. Numerous other things that I can go into. Um, prudently, we, we continue to look at this. We continue to assess the vulnerabilities in concert with the Department of Homeland Security and others. 
Um, and uh, if at any time we identify that there is a vulnerability that needs to be addressed. But, but you're um, saying that so far you've not seen anything that would indicate to you that that needs to occur. That's, that's what I wrote down. But beyond the numerous things that we've already done, and, and I'll give you an example. We, as things have emerged, such as um, in the aftermath of 9-11, as the security forces have had to work in, in, in increased overtime, we've seen issues of fatigue, and we're about to address that. There have been issues with respect to the training of security officers, and we're about to address that. So we have taken numerous steps. We continue to look at it as we identify issues, and as issues emerge, we are not standing still. We're acting. Well, I, I think from what this committee has heard, I, I hope that your agency's position is not one of you, you are finished, as, as to the extent that your language w would leave us with, with that impression. Um, Th that's correct. The, as, as I said in my oral remarks and my testimony, we continue to examine this in concert with the Department of Homeland Security and others. The, the other issue that, that I, I would like to, to hear Mr. Conklin speak on, uh, the other issue that I would like to hear Mr. Conklin speak on is um, when we've looked at the issue of the evacuation um, and the risk assessment, um, I, obviously there are long-term issues uh, with respect to areas that have been evacuated. And I I'm unfamiliar with the extent to which your planning goes past the issue of attempting to protect the public by their evacuation and goes into the issue of the emergency response in an area once a release has occurred. If the public is evacuated and your plans work, how far down the path does your plan go in addressing the issue that's been impacted, the area that's been impacted? The current plans um, for those areas, there, there's a couple of plans that come into play. One is the Federal Radiological Emergency Response Plan. That is then supported by the Federal Response Plan and, and all of the infrastructure that goes along with that. If we were to get to a point where we actually evacuated people and had contamination in an area, um, we would re re fall back on and utilize the Federal Response Plan to put together a response that could address whatever contamination is present, develop plans and procedures for removing that decontamination, cleaning the area up, and as soon as reasonable, returning people back to the area. Obviously, the amount of time that would take would depend on the amount of contamination present. What kind of isotopes are there? What were the kind of areas that were affected? And those, and a lot of site unique um, characteristics that would have to take into effect. But we would fall back and use the federal response plan as a as a responding plan. Have you, have, assuming then there's an area where they, where there are individuals that cannot return, have you done modeling as to what it would be necessary uh, to support? a population that has been dislocated? Not specifically to Indian Point. Uh, several years ago, I know the EPA did some modeling to determine what it would take to evacuate people, support them, house them, feed them, um, um, economic impacts and things like that, but we didn't do it for any particular site. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Mr. Miller, the, uh, you talked about the hardened sites, and, and I understand that to be uh, generally steel-lined, reinforced concrete um, type structure. The, the, con site. the containment structures which right. uh, house the reactor itself and much of the critical equipment is within such a structure. But in many instances, the spent fuel is actually kept outside of that in cooling pools, am I right? Outside, con outside containment, yes, but the, but the structure itself, the walls of those pools are, in fact, structures of the sort you've described, very thick concrete walls, reinforced concrete. Yeah. Um, what I'm getting is, is whether the susceptibility to, to access them is easier than the, the main structure itself, and I guess they would be a little less secure? All of the... Um, spent fuel storage pools are within the protected and what we call the vital areas of the plant and so they get the same protection that other vital equipment uh, associated with the reactor itself um, get. 
No, they're not, they're, they're not in the hardened site, though. They're in a site that has concrete walls, but not necessarily within the hardened site that we talked about for the they, reactor they, The enclosures are not hardened like the containment building is hardened. Right. So getting back to what we talked about a little earlier about the design basis threat, and you didn't apparently want to be too specific about what your new uh, requirements are. But let me ask you, um, do they take into account the use of a, sh uh, a shoulder-mounted missile? Would they be able to withstand that? I, I don't believe I can answer that question. Th they do look at what is available to terrorists today. This, uh, looking at the kinds of armaments, the numbers the, of attackers, those are all the things that the Commission right now has under consideration working with the intelligence community, with the Department of Homeland, Homeland Defense and others. Well, I, you know, the I specific guess I attributes you say that I, cannot, I cannot address. I mean, we're going to find out one way or the other, so you can give them to us in a classified session or, or somewhere on like that. It would have, have to, to be in a session like right. that. And, and we have to know, and, and I want to see that. But you keep moving the line on me a little bit here. I don't think purposely, whatever, but you talk about things that are under consideration, and I'm looking to find out things that are actually implemented as opposed to things you still consider. So when I say something like the, the shoulder-mounted missile or the 50 caliber sniper rifles that can uh, go right through armor and things of that nature, whatever like that, I'd be interested in knowing whether these specific types of threats uh, are accounted for and what you now require these facilities to uh, be prepared to deal with. Yeah, that, that's going to get me into where I don't, I cannot go. No, no, but I mean, that's where I want to go eventually, and I want to know whether or not you have Right. actually put those requirements into place or whether you still just have them under consideration? No, no I can't talk about what the threat is uh, and the right. specific attributes. Right, so but, backing but off of the specifics, just ask if, let me ask this. Have you got new requirements in place or are they just under consideration? I thought they had that clarified. No, the, uh, the, as far as the design basis threat, that's the thing that is, that is being evaluated. But I want to reemphasize something I said earlier, and that is that we have not waited for the design basis threat to be uh, redefined. We have put in place numerous um, measures that enhance the security of the, of the plant, that raise the level of security way beyond what existed under the old design basis threat, or the current design basis threat, the one that existed prior to 9-11. And does a plant's ability to live up to those standards or not affect its licensure or continuation of, of licensure or relicensure? Yes, we made an issue, uh, we issued the enhanced requirements through an order. Yeah. Now, I'm a little concerned, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, about the Bush administration's apparent failure so far to provide for us a report on the potassium uh, iodide that was required concerning the distribution of that. Can you bring me up to date on where we stand with that? I understand we've, uh, we've, um, that the National Academy of Science has been asked to look at this, but I don't know the details. I don't, I can't well, they myself would, give you. We can, we'd be happy to provide that information to the right. subcommittee if that's right. acceptable. Well, the whole report was due December 12th. That clearly didn't happen. And my understanding was they weren't even asked for the, the Academy of Science wasn't even asked by then for the report, right? Or to start the report. I'm looking for somebody who can answer that question. I can't answer that question. Somebody, somebody in the back seems to know the answer. Who apparently cleaned out your entire office to join us here today. <laughs> Let me ask, is there anyone else who I need to swear in? <laughs> <laughs> I do need you to stay. Thank you. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, all truth, and nothing else? Yes. Thank you. Would you state your name and your position, please? My name is Patricia Milligan. Little, uh, put the mic My name is closer. Patricia Milligan, and I'm a senior emergency preparedness specialist with the NRC. I'm also a right. certified health physicist. Right. Thank you for being here. And if you'd leave your card with the transcript, that would be yes. helpful. Thank you. Would you restate your question, please, okay. sir? If I can at this stage, I feel like I should stand up and sworn in again. <laughs> we, <laughs> the, uh, the report was supposed to be given to us, given to Congress by December 12th. My understanding is that the National Academy of Sciences hadn't even been requested to start the report by that date. The National Academy was um, aware of the reports, um, was aware of the bioterrorism legislation had been discussed, they had received the funding or the authorization for the funding within the past 
week or two. I'm not sure if the money's actually transferred hands yet at this point, but they plan to start the study um, at the end of May or early June. NRC has been contacted to be a part of uh, the testimony to be presented to the National Academy. Okay, so they're going to start working on the report around the time that they were supposed to deliver to us the report for June. As I understand it, that's um, what has happened. Now, I'd just be curious to know who in the Bush administration was in charge of that miss. I mean, who, I, whose responsibility was it? Was it somebody at the, is it Mr. Ridge? I, I don't know who it, in the administration was responsible. Um, my understanding was he, when the Governor Ridge was first appointed by the White House, you know, he was the one that was going to coordinate across all the various agencies, all of the things that were going on uh, to prevent things like this from happening. At least that's the impression we've got. Now he got moved to a new department. We're still waiting for his replacement at the White House. So does anybody know why the President hasn't appointed that replacement yet? Is there any problem within the department? I don't know. The, uh, I think it's important to, to get that report and to find out how it is we're going to distribute the KI beyond the 10-mile radius. Uh, there are people in my communities where uh, those potassium pills were put out in uh, drugstores and they were gone in a day. I mean, it's important to people, uh, you know, that they have some comfort and security knowing that they're going to have the ability to access um, that potassium. And, and I'd like to have tabs. If you can nail down a time plan on that as to just when it's going to be started and when the anticipated date is going to be and share that with us, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, Congressman, we understand the question and we'll work to get you an answer. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Miller, I understand that uh, emergency exercises are sometimes conducted at nuclear power facilities, right? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. And have you ever required the facilities to conduct those emergency exercises involving a terrorist attack? We have not required it. If what you're referring to are the emergency exactly. preparedness exercises, we have not required it. We've we performed one recently at a plant in California, but uh, we have not required it. Well, how might an emergency exercise that incorporated uh, terrorism differ from your, the other exercises that you generally do? I, well, I'm not certain. Every scenario is different. Uh, FEMA working with uh, you know, the help of NRC and others to find scenarios. I say that we've not had terrorists that uh, we've not required terrorist related emergency exercises. We have had over the years uh, exercises that involve uh, sabotage and the like. It involves a uh, uh, sabotage of a pump or a, uh, an electrical power supply and the like that contributes to a sequence of events which results in a release, a large release from the, from the uh, plant. And then the test is how well on-site decision makers and off-site decision makers deal with that sequence. I guess what I was thinking was it, it would be a little different if it was a terrorist attack because the people might have to respond to all those things while they were still under fire or still under some sort of attack. So you might be dealing with a release that was uh, more exacerbated and happening faster in that instance. I think that brings us back to the earlier uh, conversation about the potential for off-site uh, and uh, ramifications of a terrorist attack, that's a fair question. Okay. Do all of the plants that you know of, do they have an emergency plan in place that incorporates your local first responders, your SWAT teams, or, or whatever might be necessary to uh, respond to that kind of an incident? I can't speak to that, but I can say that in our order on security, we required all companies to look at their emergency plans as they needed to be adjusted to have links uh, established with uh, off-site officials, the local uh, law enforcement and the like. So in our order, we did uh, look for all of our licensees to uh, examine their re and, and upgrade their emergency plans to deal with that sort of issue. But y your question is a broader one. Perhaps I'm happy to have Mr. Conklin just uh, respond. As far as integrating the off-site first responders, all of these plans do that. Um, we work closely with the medical communities, for example, the hospitals and, and the um, first responders around these facilities, the fire departments. And in a lot of cases, there are, uh, there are memorandums of agreement or understanding between, for example, the um, nearest fire station to help provide fire support on site. So we need to work closely to ensure that those things are integrated. Do you have the plans doing force on force sort of exercises incorporating all of that? We in my uh, remarks, I, I talked about the right. force-on-force force exercises that we are 
uh, initiating. We've got a pilot program. Uh, some four plants across the country will engage in this pilot program. The intent of this is to perfect the, the, the methods and then to uh, conduct such exercises on a every three-year basis at all plants across the country. Every three years? Every three years. Do you think that will be sufficient? That's a, uh, these are very significant efforts. I mean, it's um, a large undertaking. They're very challenging, tough uh, exams. And uh, the, uh, that's more frequent than what we had done prior to 9-11. What's the turnover rate of uh, security personnel within those plants, though? I, I can't speak to that. It varies from plant to plant. But I must say that beyond those, those um, um, mock attacks, those force-on-force -force exercises, we will continue to do our, our inspections of security at the plant. So it isn't as if there will be no inspection during that period of time. Thank you. My time is apparently up. Thank you for your answers. Mr. Janklow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Con uh, Mr. Conklin, when uh, Congresswoman Kelly asked you if you would uh, include in your report um, uh, somewhat of an analysis on the communication problem, could I ask you if you'd expand on that, please? If you, let's just take four plants in the country, the one at San Onofre, Monticello in Minnesota, uh, the Public Power District one in Nebraska, and Indian Point. And if you would uh, prepare for this committee, because I think it would be terribly enlightening for everybody, run an analysis of what are the communications that all of the various government entities utilize. Uh, I'm aware some are on high band and some are on low band. Some are on UHF, some are on VHF. Some are on AM, some are on FM. Some are on low band, some are 150, 450, 700, 800, 900. My point is, I think we're going to find that sheriffs and police departments, city street departments, state highway departments, state highway patrols or state police, depending on what they're called, uh, local ambulance services or ambulance services and hospitals, um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the ATF, the FBI, we're going to find everybody's almost on a different system and different frequencies, I think, as you know, that in a true disaster, we can have mock we can have mock exercises with a plant, but you can't with the public. The public, when they get called upon, it's going to be their first time and it may be for real. And without the ability for everybody to be able to communicate together, all the planning in the world is going to be irrelevant. It's truly, you're going to have mothers looking for their children. One's in a school, another one's in a daycare center someplace, the parents at work. Uh, no one's going to follow some orderly evacuation process. And I'm not saying this in a critical way, but communications becomes absolutely crucial to the success of a mission. And it would be very helpful, I think, to this committee and, 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 and to decision makers if you could prepare as part of the analysis response to Congresswoman Kelly all four of those plans. It, wouldn't be, it won't be difficult, and it's not your fault or problem. We, we understand that. The, the FCC has all of these frequencies allocated and busting them loose from them. It's easier to get something out of the Soviet Union sometimes than it is the FCC. And so it's not, it's not a problem with you folks, but you could help enlighten all of us so that we could maybe get involved in the decision-making process between the legislative and ex executive branches. W would you do that, sir? Uh, yes, sir. Could you just mention the third plant you uh, mentioned? Uh, San Onofre in California, mm -hmm. Monticello in Minnesota. I can't think of where the ones located in Nebraska and, and Indian Point. The only reason I did that is those are four dispersed geographical areas. If the and so I think it would highlight it. If the gentleman suspend, if you would just make sure our uh, committee got that and we will make sure it gets to Mr. Janklo and others. And, and then, M Mr. Miller, I, I, maybe my questioning hasn't been fair to you. I, I ask you about terrorist incidences and you keep responding how the designs have been to earthquakes and, and hurricanes and things of that nature. And I think it's fair to say, back when these plants were designed, no one ever anticipated that 
there would be suicide missions to fly into them, for example. People were far more concerned about a, a ground assault or stealth of some kind to get inside of them. Is this part of the problem that you have, sir, that the, uh, the chairman really was asking questions around that area, um, you know, very well, that, that uh, uh, terrorists know the vulnerabilities. If we have people that are prepared to die, and we have people that have uh, huge amounts of force. It's probably fair to say, isn't it, that these plants may withstand it under certain circumstances, but this isn't what they were designed to deal with. Is, is that correct? Well, there are the two parts. There's the part that involves the overland. Could, could you move closer to your yes, mic? There sir? are the two parts. There's the part that involves the attack on the plant, and and. I hope that the terrorists, if they are studying the situation, will see that if they were to attempt to attack a plant, they're dealing with a very menacing situation with a very heavily armed security force at, that, uh, at those plants with very significant external barriers, intrusion detection systems and the like. The security was strong That's prior to 9-11 and it's stronger now. The other part has to do with cataclysmic or, or extreme events such as airplanes and the like. And as I've said we have been doing studies. Um, the the um, results of those are not completed at this point, but it's in that regard that I talked about these plants being designed not specifically for a current day modern or a modern jetliner, but they are designed for these other phenomena. And that leads to an inherent very strong set of structures and so the public shouldn't have the view that these are facilities that, that are soft targets, easily impacted by, you know, by extreme events such as that. Understand, but, and, and I, but I think we can all appreciate the difference between a hurricane or a tornado and, 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 and a sizable aircraft flying into them as opposed to a Cessna, Cessna 172 or a Piper Archer or something. The, the studies that, that have been done to this point have indicated that the existing planning basis, emergency planning basis, needs not to change at this point because it already requires the ability to deal with very large, rapidly developing releases from a nuclear power plant. It's a testament, really, to the strength of the emergency planning basis that was in place prior to 9-11 that we make that comment. It is not intended to downplay the, uh, you know, the potential uh, for these attacks. Uh, and so it's in that res respect that we make the comments we One made. last question, and I'd like to ask you both, in your personal opinion, is the jurisdiction that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has to deal with these types of situation and the jurisdiction that FEMA has to deal with them, recognizing the new Homeland Security, does, does each of your responsibilities lie in the correct area of the government? Is FEMA the right place to deal with it outside the facility and the NRC inside the facility? And I'm frankly more concerned outside than inside. I think you know, I think the safety within these facilities has been exhibited to show is very, very significant, other than a cataclysmic type of, of um, explosive attack, if I can put it that way, as a po or impact attack. But in terms of FEMA's responsibility, which is awesome, to deal with perceived panic, concern, orderly evacuation, caring for people, is FEMA the right agency, Mr. Conklin, to have this in your personal opinion? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Miller, I am going to ask you two questions, and I want a yes or, an, or a no answer on the two questions. And then I have a follow-up. Were there any out-of-sequence activities or crediting used during the last exercise at Indian Point? I believe there were. There were credited. What, do you know if it was crediting or out of sequence? I'm not sure I understand the distinction. And if you're referring to offsite, I would respectfully ask that 
FEMA answer that question. Perhaps Mr. Conklin may not Mr. Conklin? Know, know the details, but. Mr. Conklin? There were out of sequence exercises conducted as part of the review and evaluation of the Indian Point um, plans and procedures. Will you give me a yes no answer to this question? Were the reception center activities done in real time or out of sequence? I believe they were done out of sequence. I have in my hand an internal memo. It's an older memo from FEMA. This states, the root causes identified in the Indian Point 2 accident for failure in emergency preparedness were unrealistic drills and artificialities in the practice of new or existing procedures. The result was that in this real incident, the state and locals could not respond to the continuous flow of information, nor could they integrate their response as needed. This could affect our assumptions about out-of-sequence demonstrations and the impact of granting credits and exempting exercise demonstration and evaluations. I'm reading this into the record because this memo came from FEMA. I think it's very important that we focus on what exactly is being done to face this realistically, instead of putting in, taking in credits or doing something out of sequence. When was the last time that an unannounced exercise took place at Indian Point, Mr. Conklin? I don't know. Mr. Miller? There have been a number of unannounced No, I just uh, want when the last site. time was. On site. I don't know. On site, there have been a number of those, but off site, I, I am not aware. When was the last on site? I can't unannounced. recall. Unannounced. Uh, the, the, there are various drills that are done to, in fact, among other things, assure that people can respond within uh, required times. Uh, those are done periodically. Within the framework of those people that have already been sworn in, is there anyone sitting in the audience that can answer that question? So you don't know if there was ever, is that a safe assumption? You don't know if there was ever an unannounced exercise. Are you referring to an exercise that involves all of the off-site responders, local officials and the like? Well, you gave me a choice, so let's take both. Yeah, if, internal if and external. Offsite uh, emergency exercises, because they require numerous uh, people who have other jobs beyond just uh, emergency preparedness, uh, are planned well in advance of the time that those are, are conducted. What I was referring to is on site. Uh, there are periodic drills run at all power plants to look at the ability for people to respond in short time. Individual drills. I just can't give you the exact times that those were done. I know that they have been done. Can over you the past get back to me on the point. answers to these questions? I have another question, and that is: Is it, Mr. Conklin, is it correct that FEMA is going to soon be taking public opinion on the proposed changes to the REP program? You can just answer yes or no. We don't have that in our, in our plans at this moment. So the answer is no. You're not going to take public opinion. You're not going to take uh, public comment. No, okay. not through a formal process. No, we have not set that up. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you. We will get to the next panel very shortly here. I, um, I, I as I've listened to the response, I'm kind of wrestling with um, why we're not making much progress, a at least as far as I, I can see. And I don't mean, um, I don't really understand much more than when I started this hearing. Uh, I know that 50 percent of the electric generation is coal and 20 percent is nuclear, and I know it's huge, and I know that we have to be concerned about global warming, and I know we need energy, and I know we got to be careful that we don't uh, foolishly shut down plants and, and cause uh, a crisis in energy. I know all of those things, but what I find eerie is that I would get a letter that basically 
uh, from the chairman of the NRC that basically doesn't feel that there is um, any uh, significance to an, a terrorist attack other than any other kind of crisis at a, a nuclear uh, generating plant. And I am concerned with the concept in his letter that, that the Witt report had undue weight to the impact of potential acts of terrorism. And then I'm trying to reconcile, Mr. Miller, your comment when Mr. Tierney asked. He said, I would assume that during an accident release, everyone at the facility would be working together to stop a potential release in a terrorist incident, however. Wouldn't you assume a faster radiological release since the operators may be trying to apply compensatory measures under gunfire and explosions? And you said yes. So in that sense, you see it, and yet you don't relate it to the bigger picture. And um, I just find this kind of like uh, there's no connection. I would, I would be much more comfortable if you just said, you know, obviously there are going to be differences, and, and we're working on it. That would make me feel a lot better. It doesn't make me feel good that uh, we have never, ever found a need to look at an evacuation plan and say maybe the plant needs to be shut down. Uh, and Mr. Conklin, I want to ask you, uh, does FEMA agree with the NRC that the WIT report gives undue weight to potential terrorist attacks? Do you believe the WIT report gives undue weight to the potential terrorist attacks? We believe that all potential accident scenarios need to be considered and looked at when developing emergency response plans around these facilities or other facilities, whether they're chemical, nuclear, or, or anything else could, in which the release of hazardous materials or radioactive materials can cause an off-site impact. You, you answered a question we, I didn't ask, but now answer the question I asked. I believe to ignore it is to ignore the elephant in the room. That's, it's a big issue there. And we need, to, we need to address it and take a look at it from the standpoint of the guidance that we currently have in place and how we conduct our exercises. Coughlin, I don't you, believe it gives undue weight. No, I don't. Mr. Chairman, may I try? No, 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 no not yet, not yet, not yet. The, the, uh, you got it to the end, and the question is you do not believe what? I do not believe it gives undue weight. I believe it needs to be, it's an issue that needs to be looked at. It needs to be looked at seriously. And I believe with the new formation of the Department of Homeland Security, and FEMA's incorporation into the Emergency Preparedness and Response Directorate positions us well to take advantage of a lot of activities across the government that can help us look at this issue in a much broader, more detailed view. Mr. Miller? Mr. Chairman, context is everything here, and that comment that we made was made recognizing that as Mr. Witt uh, himself for the, the Witt group uh, acknowledged it wasn't within their charter to look at security in detail. They didn't have the time to look at security in detail. The report recognized that. The Commission issued that letter to uh, make clear that many steps were taken, that, were, that the report and the WIT committee was not, a WIT uh, study was not able to, uh, to examine. And so it was in that context that we said we thought it appeared as if undue weight may have been given, uh, that not enough was recognized regarding the kinds of steps that I talked about earlier. So it was not in any way uh, downplaying you know, terrorism and the potential impacts that they could have. And as far as differences are concerned, certainly uh, a scenario involving terrorism would be different than uh, you know, sequences that, that uh, might involve, uh, you know, a, uh, a pump or a power supply and the like. But what we have always required is that the emergency plan be able to deal with a whole spectrum of things, things we can't even think about today. And it's in that respect, it's in the results, it's in the outcome that we have talked about how the current emergency um, plans we feel uh, address and encompass the kinds of things that can occur as a result of a terrorist attack. We're talking about the potential for releases from the plant. We have always required that large, fast developing uh, releases be, uh, be um, addressed through emergency planning. 
I feel like you're giving me old theology. And, and I feel that it is not pertinent to what we are dealing with now. And um, so we're going to have just a difference of opinion. You obviously are telling me what you believe, and it scares the heck out of me that you believe that. Uh, it gives me no confidence, and I didn't intend to come to the hearing. I thought you would, the, this panel would be quick in and quick out, and I thought we'd spend a lot more time with the third panel. Um, but uh, so it's just, uh, it's probably been one of the most unsatisfying panels in my four years that I've ever listened to because I feel like we aren't being honest with the American people. That's the way I feel. Well, we, we continue to look at the vulnerabilities. I've said that. We have not stopped looking at the, at the potential um, vulnerabilities associated with terrorism. And, and hope, hopefully you don't take away from this that we have stopped in, in all of the actions that we think um, you know, will ever need to be taken have been taken. We're, we're continuing to examine that. So in that sense, uh, we've not closed out. Uh, our consideration of what the potential effects of terrorism would be. I'm just going to read this paragraph. I got it from the chairman, and then we're going to go to the next panel. While we appreciate and recognize the effort that went into the draft report, we believe the draft report appears to give undue weight to the impact of potential acts of terrorism on emergency planning and preparedness. And continuing it in context with the rest of what's said, Emergency preparedness programs are designed to cope with a spectrum of accidents, including those involving rapid large release of radioactivity. Emergency preparedness exercises have invariably included large releases of radioactivity that occurs slightly shortly after the initi initiation of events. Necessary protective actions and off-site response are not predicated on the cause of events. Whether releases from the plan occur as a result of terrorist attacks or equipment malfunctions, emergency plans guide decision makers and responders in the same way. Preliminary results from our vulnerability studies do not indicate an increased source term or quicker release from terrorist initiated events than is already addressed by the emergency planning basis required by the NRC regulations and in place at any point. I believe that's old theology. That's what I believe. Well, it is my practice to allow the last word on the part of the panelists. So you have the last word, and then we'll get to the next panel. Mr. Conklin, is there anything that you wanted us to ask that you were prepared to say that you need to put on the record? I would just like to say that the REP program um, is committed to supporting the efforts of state and local governments to improve the planning and exercise process. And thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, before you today. And and what we will do is continue to work with the folks around Indian Point and all the other nuclear sites to improve their programs and plans. Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, the NRC has taken strong steps to uh, assure that uh, security is appropriate for this post-9-11 environment. We continue to examine the uh, threat uh, environment, uh, working closely with the uh, a Department of Homeland uh, Security and and uh, other appropriate federal agencies, um, and uh, we will also continue to work with stakeholders uh, uh, at all plants, in particular the Indian Point plant, as the uh, the state, the FEMA, and others work to address the issues that have uh, come up in that case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Our second panel. Uh, is the Honorable Richard Blumenthal, Attorney General, State of Connecticut, Mr. John Wiltsey, Director, Office of Emergency Management, State of Connecticut, and the Honorable Richard Bond, First Selectman, Town of New Canaan, which is also in the State of Connecticut. A little bias towards Connecticut in this panel here. Gentlemen, you could just remain standing, and I'll swear you in before you sit down. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Please be seated. Just change those names around. We have, um, we have you in reverse here, but we'll just, we'll just switch those around. Would you change the names? Um, <laughs> that goes over one. <laughs> what we do? There we go. No, 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 no. No, switch the end. There 
There we go. Thank you. Gentlemen, sorry to keep you waiting. Um, your uh, testimony uh, it will be part of the record. You can uh, uh, read from your testimony. You can uh, uh, summarize it and make comments to uh, comments you've already heard. Um, you, you have the time, and it's yours. And I think we are going to start out with you, Mr. Blumenthal. Is that correct? And then we will go to Mr. Wilsey, and then we'll uh, end up with uh, the first selectman in New Canaan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And may I thank you and Representative Congressman Kucinich for your leadership in having this hearing, and to Congresswoman Kelly for her leadership as well, you and other congressmen from the New York area, such as uh, Congresswoman Lowy and Congressman Engel, all have been involved. And this issue really has been one that has united Connecticut and New York in a common cause simply to protect our citizens. And I want to particularly thank you for having this hearing because one of the illuminating aspects of what we've just heard is that these agencies do not plan to have any formal public comment. And so, really, you in Congress are filling that vacuum, and it is a vital task that you are performing by giving citizens and their representatives an opportunity to comment and trying to make this process more transparent, enable people to be more informed so that the level of fear can be diminished somewhat. And it is, in many respects, that fear that we have to fear more than anything else. And so I, I really want to thank you genuinely for the enormous educational function that you are performing. Just to spend a second, uh, I would want to point out that Mr. Tierney has really been uh, very leading a very strong effort in this area and has kind of taken over from Mr. Kucinich. So. He's just afraid I'll ruin Kucinich's reputation, so he wants to make it clear. <laughs> I, I express my thanks to Congressman Tierney as well. Uh, when, uh, let, let me first, may I say that I submit my testimony for the record, and I'll just very briefly restate it, uh, but also react to some of what we've heard so far. When you commented, Mr. Chairman, that we were hearing the old theology, I would go even further back. I think we're in the stone age of planning for security against terrorist attack on our nuclear facilities. And in a sense, Indian Point is just a poster child for the lack of planning and safeguarding of these facilities across the country. These facilities really are dirty bombs waiting to be detonated. They are vulnerable to attack, and they are improperly and inadequately safeguarded from that kind of attack, which we cannot anticipate in detail. But we do know, Mr. Chairman, as you stated so well, that the terrorists no more than the people. And part of what we need to do is make this system more transparent. The WIT report says, and we all know, that the current planning is inadequate in part because, largely because, it fails to address the possibility of nuclear, uh, the terrorist attack on these nuclear facilities. And in fact, it says, and I'm quoting, the plans do not consider the possible additional ramifications of a terrorist-caused release. FEMA has accepted <clears throat> the fact that the current plans are inadequate, but it has ducked its responsibility by kicking back the issue to officials in New York. In my view, the plant should be shut down until we have adequate planning, including safeguarding against terrorist attack. And it's more than my opinion that counts. I believe that is also the law. The law indeed requires that there be an adequate plan. Connecticut has petitioned FEMA. We will side with environmental groups that have petitioned the NRC. We will go to court if necessary. But I believe that this Congress has a unique obligation as well as opportunity 
to send a profoundly important message to the industry and the federal regulators that it will not tolerate this kind of buck passing. Congressman Janklow asked the question, who is at fault? Whose fault is it that we have inadequate planning? And the simple answer is, we don't know. No one can say, given the current state of the law and given the current buck passing that has happened and is ongoing. There are obviously needs for legal accountability and, more important, public policy accountability here that is simply not happening. And in my view, the regulatory agencies have dismissed and disregarded the very real threat of terrorist attack in the public pronouncements that you have cited, Mr. Chairman, and that people simply will not accept. What we need to do is, on Indian Point, shut it down until there is adequate planning. There may be objections that the power has to be made, made available from other sources. There are other sources. They are affordable. And they are achievable and must be achieved because the safety and security of citizens who live in that area is at stake. Let me just close very briefly by saying that the WIT report finds that this plan is inadequate not only because it fails, to guard against or plan for terrorist attack. But any sort of release would trigger an emergency that there simply have not been plans for. In terms of evacuation, Connecticut's roads would be involved. One third of our population, including many of our major cities like Bridgeport, Norwalk, Stamford, Waterbury, Danbury, all would be at risk within the 50-mile area. Our food and water supplies would be jeopardized. And the plan really is inadequate because it fails to consider common sense as well as science. That parents, for example, will not evacuate separately from their children. You don't need to do another study to know the, the answer to that question. And so I think that uh, I, I just want to thank uh, this committee for its contribution, thank the members of this panel who have helped to lead it, and say that as state officials, we need federal help. We need it in resources. We need the science that federal officials can make available to us. We need it now. And we also need, again, accountability. This committee has asked the right question, whose fault is it? And someone has to answer, it's mine, it's ours. And right now, that isn't happening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Blumenthal. Um, Mr. Wiltsey. Mr. Chairman, distinguished subcommittee members, it is a privilege to appear before you today. The central question for emergency managers is not whether nuclear plants should or should not be shut down. The central question is how can we advance existing readiness. One of the basic first steps of, in emergency planning is to accurately define the threat. On February 25th of this year, before this very committee, Dr. John J. Hamry of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, following an eighth-month analysis of likely terrorism threats, testified that chemical and liquefied natural gas facilities were among the most vulnerable industrial facilities in our nation. In analyzing the security of nuclear facilities, the center found them to be extremely secure from nearly all types of potential attacks. It is this type of independent analysis that can correctly help direct emergency planning resources. The federal government should initiate its own comprehensive vulnerability assessment of nuclear and other industrial facilities. Actions such as requiring the hardening of any critical soft structures or implementing tighter FAA flight restrictions should be considered if determined necessary. 
With all the attention on nuclear readiness since 9-11, one would assume that there has been some new federal resources for municipalities to advance preparedness. Unfortunately, that is not the case. The fact is that there is no federal agency currently providing direct nuclear preparedness funding to any state or municipality. Yet there is a tremendous demand for new emergency management technology and communication systems at the local level, as highlighted in New York State's James Lee Witt report. For fiscal year 2003, Congress has provided $165 million to fund every state and local emergency management requirement in the United States, including nuclear readiness. Contrast this figure with $200 million in special earmarks for homeland security academic type programs. If nuclear safety is a priority, then let's fund it accordingly. Generally, the past technical and staff assistance provided by FEMA has been solid. The FEMA radiological pro program developed over the last 20 years could be used to help prepare other industries for terrorism. However, there is much more that needs to be done. Overall, nuclear preparedness responsibility should be given to the new Department of Homeland Security with a redefined relationship between FEMA and the NRC. The Department of Homeland Security, with the NRC and the best scientific minds in the country, should take the lead in updating what is known as New Reg 0654, or the Nuclear Planner's Bible, last revised in 1987. And, and new exercises emphasizing fast-moving events, such as terrorist attacks, should be developed for use by states and held more frequently. A central issue for nuclear emergency planners today is the validity of current planning bases or standards that determine public protective actions. It is appropriate to ask post 9-11, are we using valid planning standards? This question can only be answered at the federal level. Here is some of what we do know. First, a joint NRC EPA task force of technical experts established the current 10 and 50 mile planning zones and their corresponding protective actions in 1980 based on a worst case scenario that is a massive quick release of radioactivity. New Reg 0654 makes no distinction between causes of a nuclear incident. It calls for planners to develop appropriate responses regardless of the cause and to expand or contract protective actions as required. And we are aware of no new studies or scientific evidence to indicate that the existing planning standards regarding the reach of potential radiation contamination are invalid. Nevertheless, the Department of Homeland Security and the NRC should immediately reevaluate and recertify these current planning standards. Meanwhile, the federal government should work with states to design appropriate new public precautionary measures to address the common sense realities of spontaneous evacuation and the need for better public information. As a congested state and a neighbor to New York, we are concerned about the issue of evacuation planning for all hazards, not just nuclear incidents. What we would like to see is the development of flexible regional traffic management plans that can address any hazard requiring a large relocation of citizens. Progress can be made by working together. Utilities and local governments have implemented a series of new NRC security orders since 9-11. In Connecticut, we have sent additional state and local assets to Millstone, organized regular meetings to improve coordination, developed and conducted new security exercises, and established a state quick reaction force to respond to any security need. Although nuclear site security is good, the NRC should expeditio expeditiously complete its review of the ex existing design basis threat for which nuclear facilities must plan for and consider providing dedicated federal funding or security forces to supplement existing plant security measures. In conclusion, emergency management professionals around the United States have done and will, can do a and will do a formidable job of planning for all threats to our homeland. However, to be successful, two key items are necessary. Clear and coordinated guidance from federal regulatory agencies and the tools to get the job done. I'd be happy to address any questions you may have, and thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilsey. Um, Mr. Bond. Is that, yes, it is on. Um, my name is Richard Bond. I'm the first selectman from New Canaan, Connecticut. Uh, New Canaan is a town of approximately 20,000 people. 
22 square miles in size, one hour from New York, one hour from Hartford, and three hours from Boston. We are approximately 25 air miles, excuse me, from <coughs> Indian Point Nuclear Plant. At the Board of Selectmen's meeting on February 18, 2003, the following resolution was approved and forwarded to the Town Council, Town Council for their adoption at their meeting on March 12th, this Wednesday. I'll read parts of it. Resolve that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission conduct a full review of the deficiency identified efficiencies identified deficiencies identified in the independent review of the Indian Point Energy Center's emergency preparedness plan. Such independent review was conducted by James Witt Associates at the request of the New York Governor George Pataki to improve understanding of the neighboring's, neighboring's area's ability to respond to a radiological event and to assist efforts to strengthen emergency preparedness. The latter part is further resolved that in light of the significant problems identified by the WIT report, operations at the Indian Point facility be temporarily shut down until the issues raised by the report are fully resolved. Uh, I, think this, I think we're all saying the same thing. Uh, when you read uh, the executive summary of the WIT report, the two things that stand out to me, the plan, third item, the plan, the plans do not consider the possible additional ramifications of a terrorist cause release. The plans do not consider the reality of an impact of spontaneous evacuation. I'd like to read also from the, uh, the um, Indian Point 2 nuclear power plant exercise report. Although, as noted above, no exercise finding rose to the level of deficiency as defined under 44 CFR Part 350 at this time, FEMA, in the absence of fully corrected and updated plans for the counties and states, cannot provide, quote, reasonable assurance, unquote, that appropriate measures can be taken in the event of a radio radiological emergency. One more thing, then I'll... Take your time. <coughs> Excuse me? Take your time. In my testimony, at the end of it says, a particular concern to the residents of New Canaan is a subject of evacuation. We continue to view as the most critical challenge to our emergency plan and planner, a scenario involving an incident which prompts large numbers of evacuees into and out of New Canaan area. We are aware that this concern is shared with both our neighboring communities and with the Connecticut Emergency Management Office. As a result of the complexity of this issue, combined with inadequate direction from the state and federal authorities, we have not been able to develop a practical and viable plan of evacuation. The issues which inhibit a plan's development are many. Location in the most densely populated corridor of the country, proportionate lack of limited rail, roadways, rail, and water infrastructure situated in the path of major urban escape routes and egress direction, limited by the physical obstacles of Long Island Sound and New York City are a few of the most obvious. Further, we need to factor into our planning those assets which will be committed from state and federal government sources. As of yet, we have not been made aware of the level of guidance and support we may expect to receive. We are perfectly capable of evacuating execution within the borders of New Canaan or larger scale movements of town residents to nearby areas in response to local incidents. However, the evacuation in response to regional or even broader emergencies must be developed within the scope of regional, state, and federal planning. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll start out the questions and um, just ask, uh, it, just preface my comments by saying that, that Miss um, Kelly's, her constituents are directly impacted. They're in the 10-mile radius. And She's already begun this process and had a hearing in the Department of Transportation and so on. We felt that the value of this hearing was to then look at what happens to those folks who are just kind of outside that boundary of 10 miles, but within the 50-mile radius, and also to look at what impact uh, one state has over another. For instance, um, this was the, the, the WIT report was requested by the governor of New York, logically. It's, it's overseen uh, by, uh, by the governor of New York. We have Millstone 1, 2, and 3, uh, big concerns there as well. So this report, this hearing is not just about Indian Point. It's to appreciate 
help this committee appreciate how a community looks at the issue in general. For instance, um, Mr. Bond, I'm curious, and but happy to have others respond. Um, I'm curious as to when a plan is devised, uh, let's just say there's been a plan for Indian Point for years. Were you made aware of the plan? Were you told how New Canaan fit into this plan? No. Okay. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> That's it. So we have a plan. Uh, we're going to get through this panel real quick with answers like that. <laughs> but, uh, but he's, uh, he's a lawyer's dream. <laughs> No, well, you think questions. he's a lawyer's dream, Dick. You wait till you get him on the stand, you'll regret it. <laughs> the, uh, but the bottom line to it is, you're not aware of that plan. No, no, I'm not. And so we have a plan. Um, maybe, Mr. Wilsey, you could ask me, are you aware of that plan? I mean, uh, you're in charge of emergency preparedness and so on. Would you be made aware of a plan? Not the last plan, but, you know, in general. We, we, of course, are aware of uh, New York State's plan and their county's plan, and in the event of an incident at Indian Point, uh, we'd be working with them. Um, our, response, our responsibility, of course, is to do the planning um, in accordance with the federal requirements and guidance for those communities in Connecticut that, have, um, that are within the 50-mile zone. So that is where, where our planning, if you will, if you will, begins and our responsibilities begin. So is it, is it your responsibility to make sure that the, the this first elected of New Canaan has an awareness of the plan? Is that your responsibility? That would, be, that would be our responsibility to ensure that he knows the standards that are currently set for um, the 50 mile, what's known as the 50 mile ingestion pathway procedures and plan. Okay, and we're not just talking about a superficial uh, presentation to the first selectman saying, you know, they have a plan and they, they'll be coming over your territory. This plan, are you required to develop uh, a plan that exceeds the 10 mile radius and you're supposed to help design uh, an evacuation for residents in New Canaan? Who does that? Based on current federal standards, sir, there is no requirement for evacuation plans for a nuclear incident beyond 10 miles. Um, so there are no requirements or planning standards there. Um, what Mr. Bond uh, referred to, and I also referred to in my testimony, we do see a need to develop, if you will, all hazards regional plans, um, especially in congested areas like we have in um, southwest Connecticut, that could be put in place and utilized for whatever the hazard is that might affect multiple towns. And that is clearly something that uh, needs to be worked at, uh, at through all levels of government working together. And before I um, call on you, Mr. Bloom, thought to kind of give me a sense of what I'm asking, how you respond to what I'm asking, and what you're hearing. Uh, try to give me a sense of, of what this means to you in terms of the 10 mile versus the 50, in terms of one state versus another, uh, in terms of um, a local community really not quite knowing what their requirement is and what they should do. The, require, the fact that we don't even have, appears, a plan outside that 10 miles. I mean, there's two ways that you get impacted. One is you get people from within the 10 miles coming in and, and interacting with your constituents, you, you know, using your roads and so on. The other issue is the need for evacuation for New Canaan. Should New Canaan have an evacuation plan? So, Mr. Blumenthal, you're, I'm going to ask you to kind of walk me through some of this. Just one comment. Sure. As, as of this point in time, there are roughly 445,000 people coming into Fairfield County from outside Fairfield County. Right now, just in terms of a work day. Work, yeah. yes. Yeah. Let me respond, if I may. I think there is a need for planning at the local as well as the state level, and the two have to be interrelated. In a sense, the local communities are now planning even with an inadequate plan on the part of the plant itself. New, New Canaan, for example, Westport, a number of the communities who are aware of the effect on them. One of the problems is that many Connecticut communities are not sufficiently aware of the dangers that are posed. But 
the impact on Connecticut will be real and immediate. And in fact, the impact on New York will be very sizable as well because the flight from New York will be to Connecticut. And Connecticut's roads on a good day at certain times are parking lots. They are gridlocked. So the evacuation plans involving New York have to be contingent on state and local planning in Connecticut. Likewise, our food and water supplies, many of them come from New York. They would be contaminated. We would face the same problems as New York, whether we're in the 10 or the 20 or the 50 mile radius. But I think one of the, the key aspects that you have raised is that a terrorist attack will not involve simply, if there is one, God forbid, a strike against the facility itself. Presumably, it would also involve some effort to cause disruption and damage elsewhere. The Tappan Zee Bridge, which would, again, force evacuation into Connecticut. And I guess, you know, to put it in, in legal terms that are applicable to both Connecticut and New York, there is a requirement that these facilities have plans that take account of all these ramifications in order to continue operating. Their license is contingent on adequate emergency preparedness plans. And our point is that, and we'll bring it to the courts if necessary, they have an obligation to comply with that law. Okay. Ego had questions. Yes. Uh, Ms. Kelly, do you have any questions you want to ask? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I only I have no questions except that I am delighted that you have a panel here of people from this, that our next our neighboring state of Connecticut because you're absolutely right, Mr. Blumenthal. If we don't work together, uh, the two the people who live within the 50 mile radius of this plant could conceivably be in jeopardy, given the fact that the prevailing wind usually runs from west to east. Uh, but the, also looking at the number of nor nor'easters we've had this year, dumping snow all over us, um, there are there are factors like that that we all need to think about, given our, our torturous road system in many instances. So I'm delighted you're here, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing so that we can work together like this. Um, I'm just interested. I don't think any other members have questions. You don't. Okay. You, no. Um, I would be interested in just understanding your concept of the legal requirement. You said it's just not my opinion that you said it, the legal requirements. Uh, speak to me about the legal requirements. And what legal rights does Connecticut have? We have submitted a petition to FEMA under 44 CFR 350. And the petition essentially is to compel FEMA to follow its own regulations and insist on an emergency preparedness plan as a condition for the plan continuing to operate. As you know, FEMA has found the, the current plan to be inadequate. It has asked a number of questions of New York officials, Governor Pataki and the four county executives who have declined to certify that plan. In our view, FEMA has an independent responsibility to take action, and uh, I think that the deadline, fortunately earlier deadline given by Congresswoman Kelly than the 75 or 150 days that FEMA wants to take is much more desirable. But the point is that the NRC also under its regulations, in our view, has a responsibility. There has been a petition to the NRC, similar to the one that we brought to FEMA, to compel it to suspend the license of the plant so long as there's no adequate emergency plan, again, pursuant to federal law. And that action, I believe, also has been and, and can be taken to federal court. But all of what we have been describing for this committee are potential damages that give us the standing, the right and the opportunity to be in court in challenging the current state and holding accountable 
the federal agencies that thus far have declined, as was evident in the letter from the chairman to you, to recognize their responsibility. Okay, now let me just be clear, just for the record. The plan, the legal, you have the right to challenge the plan that has not been acceptable, that, been, uh, that doesn't meet uh, legal requirements, it, it doesn't do the job. But that is, that is just a, simply a plan that has to deal with the 10 mile radius? In our view, no, it, it relates to the 50 mile radius and possibly beyond. Okay. Because we are within the 50 mile radius and, there, and the emergency preparedness plan includes that area. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, going back to 44350, in the absence of fully corrected and updated plans for the counties and states cannot provide reasonable assurance that appropriate measures can be taken in the event of a radi radiological uh, emergency. It seems to me the plans have to be rewritten, not just say meet them. Uh, I don't disagree with that, but I think they need to be rewritten to, the, to, to what the world is like today. Yeah. And they, they need to be brought from the Stone Age into yeah. the post 9-11 era where terrorist attack is an urgent and immediate and realistic fear. Mr. Wilsey, how many people do you have on your staff? Uh, currently, sir, I have um, 27. Okay. Is 27 enough people for you uh, to be able to work with all the communities that potentially you'd have to deal with with Indian Point and Millstone 1, 2, and 3? I mean, uh, it seems to me like you don't have the resources to be able to do this job. That would be a very fair statement, uh, Mr. Chairman. As I mentioned in the testimony, uh, our nuclear planning staff, and I think it's similar in most states, um, are actually funded by the utility. Um, there is no fenced or dedicated funding uh, from the federal government for nuclear planning. But even more so, our, our, um, our issues at the state level, I think we really have to focus at the, uh, at the municipal level. One of the key parts, if I could mention, of, of any plan and, and a key component um, when you're looking at the evacuation of the 10-mile plan is the importance of host communities. Host communities, um, based again on the federal guidance, are where evacuees um, are directed to go to get a variety of uh, very important things, everything from, uh, from KI uh, to monitoring to sh shelter and food if they need it. Um, all of those communities use their own resources, um, except what they might receive from the special state utility funds, again, funded by the utilities. Um, there's a great burden on those utilities, and quite frankly, it's just because that they're professional and they know that there's a need that they step up, they step up to the challenge. Let me um, just ask what you suspect when we ask, and I'm going to be asking the next panel if, if the general public knows about, if they're within 50 miles of a the nuclear plant, if they know that, one, there is a plan, two, uh, if they know what that plan is, and three, if they know what they're supposed to do to implement that plan, what do you think the response would be around the country? Do you think that we're just a little behind others, or do you think that um, uh, it's probably typical in a lot of parts of the, of the country? I'd say, Mr. Chairman, that I think it's um, typical among all parts of, of the country, anyone living within a nuclear zone. One, one of the great needs, and again, something that requires obviously a lot of resources, is public information and education. Not only also for the public, but for first selectmen and those officials who need to, uh, if you will, have the most immediate information available. There's um, a great deal, as Mr. Witt um, and his staff uh, point out in the study, for new ways to, um, uh, technological ways to communicate directly with municipalities so that they can communicate with their people. Um, there is uh, there's not a good network of communication systems, um, computer-based computer information systems throughout the nation. And um, that's definitely something that we need to work at. But simply the, the area of public information, um, uh, reaching out to the public, only by investing there are we going to be able to address the issue of spontaneous evacuation? I, I think M Mr. Witt, in, in, the, in the, if you will, the, um, his final comments uh, that he just released um, really, really hit on it and made a very good clarification. He was not saying that plans are, should be disregarded, the current plans, and that they need to be thrown out. The point that he made is that they need to be improved. 
Um, we do have some basic plans. They're certainly better than not having any plans, as I mentioned, are in the case of some other industries. But that means we need to invest um, and put the investment in to make the plans what they need to be. Thank you. Is there anything uh, that we need to put on the record, Mr. Bond? I mean, your, your concise no is uh, probably the most uh, important answer that we received. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, in all due respect, Connecticut has done some interesting things. Right? As of uh, probably this week, uh, they've uh, the uh, health uh, doctor um, Garcia has uh, put in a, a system with every health director in every town in New Canaan has a Nextel phone with one number ring. They can contact all the health directors in the whole state. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And then the uh, they are they are making available to every. Uh, Police Department, Ambulance uh, Corps, and Fire Department, a 800 megawatt, megawatt uh, radio. So we are making some progress, but we need some guidance. And we need some uh, uh, from uh, the state, and more so than this, particularly on the evacuation concern. And also, we think that, uh, again, that uh, it'd be preferable to correct the errors now and not wait for six months or a year, I think it would be helpful. I think the, uh, the feeling of the community would be so much uh, greatly improved by the fact not to shut it down for good. Make it right, then come on back. Okay. Mr. Blumenthal, anything that you'd like to put on the record before we get to the next panel? Uh, uh, I, once again, my thanks for helping to raise awareness in Connecticut about this problem because in answer to your question, Connecticut is less aware than it should be. And many parts of Connecticut, if you ask that question about where is Indian Point and should we be preparing for a possible emergency, would say Indian Point, not on the radar screen. And it should be. And there should be, uh, and I would just conclude with this thought, uh, there should be better planning and coordination between the two states in communication, evacuation, medical and food and other supplies, and right now there is virtually none. Just as the answer to your question about New Canaan was no, the answer to the same question if asked, is there ongoing planning for Indian Point as a possible disaster area between the two states, the answer would be no. And that is uh, really an irony because one of the findings of the WIT report is that the news of a disaster, whether it's a terrorist attack or any other kind of disaster, will, be, will spread instantaneously. And the current plans are inadequate because they assume that the government will be disseminating this information in the way that it wants to do rather than the public using cell phones and all the technology that are really not taken into account by the current plan will make use of. So uh, again, my thanks to you for increasing public education, which we need to, to increase even more. Thank you. I thank you. I, I, I'll use my old theology just before concluding here to say that I suspect that the view used to be and still is, unfortunately, that if we tell people about an evacuation plan and what they have to do, they start raising questions about why do they need to know this. And then it, it unfortunately might call into question uh, whether we need nuclear energy at all, which I happen to believe has a role to play in this country. And so I think the industry probably tries to downplay it. But if we're going to be honest with the American people, if we have this type of energy, and we do, we get 20 percent of it. Uh, for electricity throughout the United States. We better know how to, how to respond to it and how to protect ourselves. But in one sense, this is kind of a surreal conversation, though, isn't it? Because if we had to evacuate, there's the question, would you ever get to come home? Which is uh, a little unsettling. I thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you waiting so long. And uh, you're, you're, this is very helpful to us. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. So he, he, he made the comment. We're going to do our panel three, which is Mr. Jim Wells, Director, Nash, Natural Resources and the Environment, U.S. General Accounting Office, Mr. Michael Slobodin, 
uh, if I'm saying that correctly, I'm probably not, Director of Emergency Programs, Entergy Nuclear Operations, Inc., Mr. William Renz, Director, Nuclear Protection Services and Emergency Preparedness, Dominion Resource Services, Inc., uh, Ms. Angelina Howard, Executive Vice President, uh, Nuclear Energy Institute, Mr. Alan Matheson, Executive Director, Riverkeeper, and Mr. David Lockbaum, uh, Nuclear Safety Engineer, Union of Concerned Scientists. Big panel, uh, but a very important panel. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for staying standing, and I will swear you in. Now, is there a likelihood that you would be calling on someone else to be able to respond? We'll get another chair if we need it. So is this, there anyone else that might? Uh, if you are, I'd, I'd appreciate you standing up, and uh, we'll swear everyone in. And if we call on you, we'll just note if you were sworn in. Uh, raising, your right, raising your right hand. Thank you, gentlemen uh, and ladies. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Note for the record, uh, affirmative. Um, everyone is responding. The affirmative, please be seated. Do we have enough chairs? I'm going to, Mr. Renz, I'm going to have you slide a little to your right, just a speck, I guess, and then slide over a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Have we left anyone out? Um, I, I may have not pronounced your name correctly, sir. Slobodin. Slobodin? Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't pronounce it correctly. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. I'm sorry you had to wait so long. I suspect you probably figured that might happen. Um, but um, uh, what I would appreciate is that you recognize that uh, this is a very important panel. We're looking forward to some of the interaction that will take place between you. Um, I would be more inclined to want to hear, have you speak for five minutes rather than ten, given the size of this panel. Um, and I think we all will have questions for you. So uh, we'll start, I guess, the way you're seated, okay? Um, and uh, uh, that's the way we'll do it, Mr. Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're pleased to be here today to discuss emergency preparedness at commercial nuclear power plants. Twenty-four years ago, March 79, the accident at Three Mile Island challenged emergency planning. The residents at Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant, they awoke in February 2000 to similar concerns. Following the September 11th terrorist attack, nuclear power plants have once again received a high level of focus and concern. Almost two years later, we're sitting here today learning that we still have to get our act together and we still have a ways to go on emergency planning. You have already heard testimonies from NRC, FEMA, and others on the events at Indian Point. Clearly, no one is going to take emergency preparedness lightly. But as you can see today, Mr. Chairman, getting facts to questions is like asking auditing questions that is sometimes difficult to get the answers, and we share your pain. At the time we looked at Indian Point, NRC had identified a number of emergency preparedness weaknesses that had gone largely uncorrected. I think it would be fair to say that over the years, Consolidated Edison's efforts to improve were not completely successful. And it's fair to say, from our perspective, that the NRC and its IGs had maintained a strong regulatory posture in finding problems. They identified problems but didn't necessarily always have the solutions. For example, 96, 98, 99, NRC identified communication weaknesses. These included delays as simple as just notifying and getting the pagers to work so that people could be told of an emergency. The IG has also issued a strong report. The plant has and is taking corrective actions to address these problems. According to a 2001 NRC inspection report, these actions, when they went in and looked, were not fully effective. Although NRC is finding problems, although of a minor nature, it expressed the view that the existing program could protect the public. The four New York communities surrounding the facilities also had their problems and made improvements over time but we continue to hear a common theme that suggests that better communication among NRC, FEMA, state and local entities is clearly needed. For example, a classic case of confusion occurred when the plant reported that a release had occurred but posed no threat to the public, yet the county officials reported that no release had occurred. This contradictory information 
has led to credibility problems with the media and the public, and it continues to do so. We also reported a concern, and the main message of our GAO report was that the NRC and the FEMA communications was oriented towards the state officials and less with local officials. Both NRC and FEMA continually told us that they had limited resources that forced them to rely on the states to work more closely with the counties. Effective communication over and over again has been pointed out as being extremely critical to respond to a radiological emergency. You've heard it today here at the panel. We recommended that NRC and FEMA reassess these policies for, communi for communicating primarily with the state in those instances where the local communities are clearly the first to have to respond to this emergency. Mr. Conkle today, Homeland Security, used the terminology working closely with the local communities. Mr. Miller, NRC, used the words closely monitoring all the existing reports that were coming up and used the terminology stepped up meetings. I guess it depends on your definition of closely because we called the local officials as we got ready for this hearing and we asked questions about how had communications improved. And I think it would be a, a general valid statement to say that the answers we were getting back from many of the local officials was that not much has changed. So I guess your definition of closely may depend on whether it's minuscule or some, but that was what we were able to find in a few days before coming to the table here today. You also asked us our opinion that about the latest review that had been done at Indian Point, and that was the draft WIT report. Uh, clearly, the, the, RIT, the RIT report was more technical than our 2000 report, but they both addressed difficulties in communications and in planning inadequacy. The WIT report implied that the current radiological response system and capabilities are not adequate to protect the public from an unacceptable dose of radiation. We are aware, Mr. Chairman, that FEMA has disagreed with some of the issues raised, but they also admit that the report does highlight several issues that are worth considering in order to improve emergency preparedness, not only at ending a point, but perhaps more importantly, nationwide. And at the risk, Mr. Chairman, of raising your ire, we also saw where NRC had commented that the report gives undue weight to the impact of terrorism. But the point, regardless of these quick positions, is that if, if the wit findings are true. These findings may have merit across the board at all the nuclear power plants, and clearly more needs to be done. Mr. Chairman, in summary, let me just say that uh, the post-September uh, 11th environment clearly raises new challenges for NRC and FEMA. NRC and the nuclear industry, some of which are here on the panel today, they deserve a lot of credit for taking action quickly to strengthen their security as a result of a changing world. However, let me just make two quick points. First, at Indian Point, there's been a lot of ink in the press. There's been a lot of audit reports from GAO, from the NRC, IG, and even the new WIT study, questioning the weaknesses in emergency preparedness. We today are still concerned that as revealed in the hearings today, problems in emergency preparedness are still commonplace. Mr. Chairman, in your opening statement, you used the terminology, deficiencies can linger for years, is unfortunately too true. Even minor problems can cause concern. As, as, as to what had happened at Indian Point, senior management officials must clearly pay attention to emergency preparedness. These plans have not received, as they should, greater visibility sometimes minimal direction and an inadequate resource allocation. We heard 27 people in the state of Connecticut, for instance. Secondly, the point I want to make is the old saying, what gets watched gets done, is particularly appropriate here. Hearings like this today that continue to focus on the NRC mission to provide quality oversight. I'm not sure we heard quality oversight today. But clearly our goal is to assist you and Mr. Chairman and your committee in sorting through where do we go from here as a nation. And I agree with 100 percent that the public has a right to know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll conclude my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Wells. I just would um, thank you for being here and uh, say to you that I appreciate that the GAO is willing to be on panels with others. It makes it more interesting rather than a separate panel. Um, but it speaks well for your organization. We thank you for that.
Thank you. Mr. Slobodin, did I get it right this time? Almost? You, you did, sir. Good. It's a good name. Thank you, sir. Chairman Shays, distinguished members, I am Michael Slobodin, Director of Emergency Programs for Entergy Nuclear Northeast. I'm honored to appear here before you today and appreciate the opportunity to provide you with this testimony. I am a board-certified health physicist with 33 years of professional experience in radiation safety, industrial hygiene, environmental programs, and emergency planning. I have responsibility for the overall program management of Entergy's emergency response activities for the Indian Point Energy Center, the James A. Fitzpatrick, Pilgrim, and Vermont Yankee newer nuclear power plants. My offices are in White Plains, New York, and I report to the president of Entergy Nuclear Northeast. Entergy is the second largest operator of nuclear power plants in the United States with 10 operating reactors and is the largest provider of nuclear power industry license renewal and decommissioning services. We manage the planning and early implementation of the decommissioning strategy for the Millstone One reactor in Waterford, Connecticut, and currently manage the decommissioning of the main Yankee reactor in Wiscasset, Maine. Today I would like to make several points regarding the Indian Point Energy Center and the implications it has for health and safety of the citizens of New York and the adjacent states of Connecticut and New Jersey. In these remarks, I rely on established science. A most significant point is that an accident at the Indian Point plants involving the release of large amounts of radioactivity is extremely unlikely, even in the event of a terrorist attack of the types we have seen on civilian and military targets worldwide. This includes the intentional crash of a large aircraft into our hardened facilities. The design of the Indian Point nuclear plants incorporates extensive safety feature redundancy and physical protection to ensure that the reactors and spent fuel facilities can withstand a wide spectrum of accidents whether caused by human error, mechanical failure, natural disasters, or acts of terrorism. The plants are in no way dirty bombs. In fact, a nuclear power plant cannot undergo a nuclear explosion. It's a physical impossibility. According to James Kallstrom, former director of the New York City Office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who at the request of Governor George Pataki performed an exhaustive security study of Indian Point, in the wake of the September 2001 terror attacks on this nation, Indian Point is, quote, an extremely safe place, unquote, and is among the best protected and most secure civilian facilities in the country. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has frequently said that Indian Point is the best defended reactor in the country. While it is possible, although extremely unlikely, that there could be a circumstance that could lead to a release of activity to the environment, radioactivity to the environment, the distances from Indian Point to New York City Connecticut and New Jersey are such that radiation dosage would, would be lower than levels that could cause acute injury or illness. Any long-term health effects would be indistinguishable from normal background levels. In short, the citizens of Connecticut and New Jersey are not at risk from an accident at Indian Point, including an event that could be caused by terrorists. In the same way, the citizens of New York are not at risk from the mil three millstone nuclear reactors in Waterford, Connecticut. This is based, these statements that I make are based on extensive worldwide experience in radiation effects gathered since the earliest use of radiation as x-rays discovered by Wilhelm Röntgen in 1895. Since that time, no environmental agent has been studied more extensively than radiation. Our understanding of radiation's transport in the environment, resulting doses, and consequent health effects is documented in many reputable sources, including the National Academy of Science Committee on Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, the Radiation Effects Research Foundation, which has studied and continues to follow the population in Japan in its response to the radiation exposure since 1945, the World Health Organization, and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, just to mention a few. I've attached in my written statement a bibliography of reports and internet websites that may be beneficial to this committee. A second key point is that the analyses related to accidents and their consequences for Indian Point plants do take into consideration a wide spectrum of causes, as I mentioned before, human error, mechanical failure, natural disaster, and indeed terrorism. None of the factors noted above, including a terrorist attack, would lead to a release of radioactivity different from what is already analyzed, and I think it's important that I explain why. Because the amount of radioactivity in the nuclear power plant is fixed, there, there's a certain inventory, it's unchanging, a terrorist event neither adds to it nor subtracts, but no worse can happen as a result of that. In fact, our emergency plans 
and those of government are designed to deal with the challenges that might be caused by a terrorist attack are, and are not dependent on the cause of an accident. The plans are symptom-based. Much as a physician treats a patient who comes into the hospital based on symptoms, so do we as emergency planners and responders deal with symptoms. And our plans are designed to work regardless of the circumstances that could cause a release of radioactivity to occur. <coughs> a third key point is that a release of radioactivity to the environment, regardless of the cause, would move into the air in a plume whose size and shape would be determined by prevailing weather. Plumes tend to be narrow, their concentration decreases rapidly with downwind distance, and the effects diminish proportionally to the increase in downwind distance. Plumes are functions of nature, they are predictable, and they are monitored easily. We know that plumes that could come from Indian Point would tend to remain in the Hudson Valley despite the fact that prevailing winds are from east to west. The structure of the valley itself keeps winds moving generally north to south or south to north in the river valley. Our knowledge of plumes, coupled with our extensive knowledge of radiation effects, enable experts such as Richard Codell and Sasabar Achiyara of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to conclude that New York City, Connecticut, and New Jersey residents are not at risk from a serious accident at the Indian Point Energy Center. While it is possible to find nuclear power plant accident analyses that predict dire consequences, such analyses have employed grossly unrealistic or impossible assumptions. Lastly, I'd like to take a few moments to speak to the report on emergency preparedness at Indian Point and Millstone issued by James Lee Witt Associates. Entergy noted that the report contains useful insights and recommendations, many of which we had underway prior to the start of the Witt report study. Two of the areas noted for improvement in this Witt report are public education and outreach. We heartily agree. We believe that all of us here today share in the responsibility to improve the level, edu level of education about nuclear power and radiation safety. This is essential to counter the fears inspired by certain advocacy groups noted by Mr. Witt, who said, quote, in pursuit of their agenda to close India Point, have misused NRC data, presumably to frighten and alarm the public. Misuse of information can lead to behavior that may endanger the public health and safety, close quote. The fears of the public about nuclear power are largely a result of use of misinformation. This is not limited to Indian Point. This indeed, as we've already been discussed, is a national issue. We disagree with a number of the points in Mr. Witt's report and do not find support for the conclusion that present radiological emergency plans are not adequate to protect public health and safety. We believe that those plans are capable and have been demonstrated to protect public health and safety in the extremely unlikely event of a serious accident at the Indian Point Energy Center. They need to be improved, there's no doubt. And we are conscientiously working with the local government and the state of New York to improve those plans. Entergy is committed to operating all of our nuclear plants with safety as the foremost objective. With that in mind, we engaged a panel of experts, including some of the most respected scientists and engineers in the areas of nuclear engineering, reactor safety, risk assessment, health physics, counterterrorism, social psychology, emergency communications, and traffic engineering, to advise us as we move forward with our emergency planning improvement efforts. This panel also provided comments to Mr. Witt on his draft report. And a brief curriculum vitae of these experts is attached to the written statement. Energy is pleased to provide this testimony, and we are prepared to work with Congress as you work toward improving the nation's security and emergency preparedness. We invite the members of this committee to visit the Indian Point Energy Center in Buchanan, New York, to see for yourselves the nature of security and emergency preparedness. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, gentlemen, and, and Congresswoman Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Renz. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. My name is William Renz, and I am the Director of Nuclear, Emer Nuclear Protection Services and Emergency Preparedness for Dominion. Dominion is one of the largest electric and gas companies in the United States with a diversified and integrated energy portfolio. In addition to Millstone, we own and operate two other nuclear plants. Dominion appreciates the opportunity to provide testimony today regarding nuclear security and emergency preparedness. I will summarize my pre-file testimony and also address your specific question about what, if any, progress has been made by FEMA and NRC with respect to emergency preparedness and security of nuclear power stations. To better understand the current regulatory oversight of these functions, it is important to remember just how much of an impact the 1979 Three Mile Island accident had on the scope and breadth of nuclear emergency planning. There were many lessons learned, and the requirements for nuclear emergency planning were expanded dramatically in the early 80s. 
For more than 20 years, state authorities and local governments within 10 miles of a nuclear power station have worked together with licensees to provide assurance of the health and safety of the general public. For many years, it has been widely recognized that the level of emergency preparedness in communities in and around nuclear power stations is superior to that of other localities. One of the many changes to the emergency planning requirements was the establishment of a 10-mile emergency planning zone. Planning for implementing protective actions within this 10-mile zone include the ability for off-site response organizations to perform a wide variety of emergency functions such as an independent accident assessment, radiological monitoring, sample collection and analysis, capability to promptly notify and communicate to the public, traffic control strategies, and provisions for reception centers and congregate care facilities. Purely from a technical standpoint, a much improved understanding of how nuclear fuel is affected during a severe accident, generally referred to as the alternate source term, indicates that the same bases used to determine the size of the 10-mile emergency planning zone would today support a significantly smaller sized emergency planning zone. Nonetheless, we do not think that now would be the time to reduce at all the level of emergency planning around nuclear plants. With respect to security at nuclear facilities, before September 11, licensees maintained a very high level of security in that portion of the plant site called the protected area. The protected area includes the nuclear reactors, safety systems, the power production facilities, and it is isolated from the rest of the overall plant site by means such as concrete vehicle barriers, double razor wire fences, defensive positions at various locations internal to or along the perimeter of the protected area, and a highly secured entry point for vehicles and employees who enter the protected area. The protected area also includes state-of-the-art technology used to detect and assess any attempted unauthorized entry. Trained and armed responders are positioned to ensure that areas vital to nuclear safety will remain secured. After the attacks of September 11th, this very high level of security within the protected area was further heightened. Additionally, security was expanded to provide an armed responder presence and surveillance capability throughout the overall plant site. Now, to give you an idea of the impact of, of this type of expansion, the protected area for Millstone is approximately 53 acres. The overall plant site is approximately 542 acres, or about 10 times the size of the protected area. The NRC has issued a series of orders requiring significant increases in the requirements for security. These new NRC requirements are intended not only to fortify a plant site, but also to ensure that plants are in place to respond to a terrorist attack. A great amount of time has been spent on tabletopping terrorist attack scenarios and how law enforcement resources would be integrated into such a response. These changes taken in total are quite far-reaching and comprehensive. The attacks of September 11th have also forced licensees to considerably strengthen their relationships with the intelligence community, communities, install counter-surveillance measures, and work towards the common protection of this critical infrastructure. Examples of these new and forming public-private partnerships are provided in my pre-filed testimony. With respect to FEMA and NRC oversight, the existing emergency planning regulatory framework serves as a solid foundation for an increasing level of emergency preparedness due to a higher level of integration with law enforcement agencies and the intelligence community. While emergency planning regulations have not been directly changed, the regulatory oversight for nuclear emergency preparedness programs certainly has been increased since September 11th. It was mentioned earlier that communications with, with stakeholders do not appear to be significantly improved since September 11th. I put to you that we are dealing with a different set of stakeholders. In the area of nu nuclear security, NRC continues to raise the level of regulatory oversight. In addition to NRC issuing a series of orders to increase requirements, the Commission is currently considering a significant expansion of the existing design basis threat as discussed earlier. With respect to the, uh, to the WIT report, it is unclear to what degree this review took into consideration the new efforts being taken by the industry and all levels of government in the charge of better securing the country's nuclear power stations. Nevertheless, we are in the progress of working with our stakeholders to improve the level of off-site emergency preparedness based on the recommendations provided within the report. In closing, Mr. Chairman, the existing emergency preparedness regulatory framework and our public-private partnerships in Connecticut provide reasonable assurance of public health and safety. 
The increased coordination with law enforcement agencies and the intelligence community has substantially strengthened emergency preparedness programs throughout the industry. Again, I thank you for this opportunity to address this subcommittee. Thank you. Ms. Howard? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Angie Howard. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Nuclear Energy Institute. Congressman Shays, uh, Ms. Kelly, Mr. Turner, Mr. Tierney, thank you for letting us be here this afternoon. The per focus of my statement really is twofold. First, I'll address the proven security of our nation's nuclear power plants. Our industry security was second to none in the industrial sector prior to September 11, 2001, and our facilities are even safer and more secure today. And secondly, I'll discuss the industry's emergency preparedness programs, which are really the gold standard worldwide. They've been tested and proven in scores of non-nuclear emergencies for more than 20 years. Today, we can discuss nuclear power plant security and emergency preparedness plans because this industry has and has had these plans in effect since its inception. Although the industry's commitment to these two facets of our business spans more than two decades, our vigilance is even more important today to ensure the safety of our workforce and the public and the security of the 103 reactors that provide electricity for one of every five homes and businesses in our country. Clearly, nuclear power plants are major contributors to regional electricity supplies. Indian Point, for example, produces nearly 2,000 megawatts of electricity, about 20 percent of the electricity that's used in the New York City area. Critics have said the plants are not needed, and closing the plants would raise consumers' electricity bills a marginal amount, $50 to $100. We can debate whether the price and how the price could change, but just looking historically, at the past two years, when on-peak power prices in the New York City area hub have increased substantially when just one Indian Point reactor was shut down, from 43 percent in winter to 50 percent in the fall and summer. Shutting down both reactors would have an even greater effect on prices, and it's not likely to be minimal. Nuclear plant safety and security is based on the philosophy of defense in depth. This includes plant design, construction, and operating, as well as exacting federal security requirements that are met and must be met by all of our nuclear plants in this country. After September 11th, the industry and the NRC conducted independent reviews of how to best improve our already high levels of security. And since then, as Mr. Rents and others have testified, the industry has increased its security force by one-third to more than 7,000 highly trained, well-armed officers. We have expanded and fortified the perimeter security zones, increased patrols within those zones. We have tightened access to our plants and strengthened vehicle barriers. Overall, the industry has spent nearly $400 million on security improvements. We have conducted in-depth studies of the aircraft analysis and looked at the impact of aircrafts on both the containment buildings, spent fuel pools, and dry cast storage facilities at these plant sites. We would be pleased to give you a separate briefing on the results of those analyses. We have also enhanced our frequent coordination with local and state law enforcement, the intelligence community, and the military. A recently released White House report recommends conducting comprehensive vulnerability and risk assessments of the nation's critical infrastructure so that resources may be applied to those areas that represent the greatest risk. The nuclear energy industry supports such a recommendation and encourages the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to coordinate its review of nuclear plant security with the Department of Homeland Security. Daily operation of nuclear energy facilities is based on an integrated approach to protect public health and safety. This includes in programs to respond to any emergency, whether an operational event or the response to a potential terrorist attack. And as with security, the plant's safety begins with its design. Safety features are built into the plant. Several separate steel and concrete barriers protect the reactor. Highly trained, federally licensed reactor operators are responsible for safe operations on a daily basis, and they are an integral part of the facility's emergency response plan. Emergency exercises and drills test emergency response capabilities both at the plant and in nearby towns. The industry and state and local governments participate in these exercises, which are evaluated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. 
We know that the emergency response programs work because they have been used to evacuate residents during both natural disasters like hurricanes and floods or in other non-nuclear industrial accidents. You asked for comments on the WIT report. The WIT report on Indian Point and Millstone's emergency preparedness is now final. While we still would take issue with the overall conclusions in the report, I do note that the report acknowledges that the two plants emergency plans comply with Federal requirements. The report just takes issue with those requirements. So if, if, if Federal agencies pursue additional review of emergency preparedness of nuclear facilities as part of a national infrastructure protection, this industry will willingly and gladly participate in that review. The nuclear industry is constantly reviewing, drilling, and improving its emergency preparedness plans, and we will, as a matter of course, consider further improvements in our, as our efforts in this area continue. In conclusion, security and emergency preparedness, just like safe operation, are fundamental components of a thriving nuclear energy industry, and in all three areas we have an exemplary record. As America's considerations of energy security and national security grow more and more urgent, we must continue to rely on reliable, affordable, clean energy generated at our nation's 103 nuclear power plants in Connecticut and Ohio and across the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matheson. Mr. Chairman. Congressman Tierney and honorable members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the 20 million people in the New York metropolitan area who live and work in the shadow of Indian Point, I thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on this crucial public health and safety issue. Mr. Chairman, I'm especially indebted to you for hosting this hearing and providing leadership in the state of Connecticut. I'm also glad to see Congresswoman Kelly, uh, our representative in Westchester, uh, here today who also held a hearing. We appreciate that very much. And also we appreciate very much the tough questions that you have asked of both the NRC and FEMA. These are questions that need to be asked of these agencies, and we appreciate your leadership in that area. You, like we, recognize that the public does have a right to know uh, what the issues are surrounding these nuclear power plants and the emergency plans. I am Alex Matheson, Executive Director of Riverkeeper, a not-for-profit environmental organization with over 5,000 members. Riverkeeper's mission is to protect the Hudson River and to safeguard the watersheds that make up New York City's and Westchester's drinking water supply. Riverkeeper is not an anti-nuclear organization. However, given Indian Point's inappropriate proximity to New York City and the consequences a major radiological release would have on the area's residents, national security, and the U.S. economy, we regard Indian Point in this post-9-11 world as a unique case that deserves special attention. Located only 30 miles from the world's financial capital, Indian Point is arguably one of the country's most attractive terrorist targets. No facility, if successfully attacked, has the potential to wreak more economic and psychological damage and impose more loss of human life and health than Indian Point. In this heightened risk, envi risk environment, we need at least two things in order to justify the continued operation of Indian Point. Plant security sufficient to repel a sophisticated terrorist attack and an emergency plan that actually works. Unfortunately, at Indian Point, we have neither. In this post-9-11 threat environment, the NRC and FEMA are scrambling. Unfortunately, they're scrambling to protect the status quo and not public safety. It is troubling that agencies are not using language that suggests that they are asking the more basic question here. Are these emergency plans fundamentally adequate? And if not, what do we need to do about that? And should we be considering shutting down Indian Point again, considering its close proximity to New York City and a dense population? I asked the NRC, if not Indian Point, then what circumstances would compel the NRC to issue a shutdown order? I, too, am alarmed that never in its history has it ordered the shutdown of a nuclear reactor. There has to be instances where it made sense to do so. In January 2002, Entergy commissioned an internal review of security at Units 2 and 3. The review, known as the Logan Report, revealed that only 19 percent of the guards believe they can repel a conventional sabotage event, let alone a 9-11 type attack. Guards admitted they are underqualified and undertrained with respect to gun handling, physical fitness, and training. Guards reported that qualifying exams for carrying weapons are often rigged. Security drills are carefully staged to ensure mock intruders fail. 
Yet one security guard was able to place mock explosives throughout the spent fuel pool buildings three times, all in less than one minute. In addition to weak ground forces, Indian Point is virtually unprotected from either a water-based or aerial attack. There is no regular Coast Guard presence. The only other protection is a structureless security zone enforced by a buoy tender and an old whaler piloted by two day reservists. The NRC admits that the only way to protect nuclear plants from air attacks is by improving national airport security. However, in response to a 2.206 petition filed by Riverkeeper, the NRC acknowledged there was a gap between security at Indian Point and at our nation's airports. In December, the NRC took the astonishing step of issuing a decision declaring the risk of terrorism will not be considered in issuing or reviewing plant licenses. The NRC claims, quote, they have no way to calculate the probability portion of the equation except in such general terms as to nearly be meaningless. In other words, because you can't accurately measure the threat of terrorism, it's okay to ignore it in determining whether nuclear plants are safely sited and protected. That may be the most bizarre and dangerous rationale for inaction I have ever heard coming from a federal agency. The NRC earlier testi testified that, that, that they are not responsible and, th and, and the plant owners are not responsible for protecting against enemies of the U.S. Well, I would ask the question, if that's the case, who is responsible and which agency of the government, if not Entergy, is responsible for protecting Indian Point? The New York Observer did an article last year uh, where they asked all of the, they polled all of the federal agencies uh, the Defense Department, uh, the FBI, CIA, and others, and Entergy, who was responsible ultimately for aerial protection, uh, and they all pointed fingers at each other, and none could say definitively that they were responsible. On Friday, James Lee Witt Associates issued the final draft of a State Commission report in which it criticizes virtually every aspect of Indian Point's emergency plan. The report concludes that, quote, the current radiological response system system and capabilities are not adequate to overcome their combined weight and protect the people from an unacceptable dose of radiation in the event of a release from Indian Point, especially if the release is faster or larger than the typical REP exercise scenario. Last month, in an attempt to dismiss WIT's devastating conclusions, FEMA issued its own report, first claiming that WIT has raised nothing new, then, without, then trying without success to rebut WIT's findings. Without ever substantiating its criticism of Witt's arguments, FEMA somehow reaches the conclusion that there is not a single deficiency in Indian Point's emergency plan. Astonishingly, FEMA insists that there is no difference in responding to a radiological release caused by an operational failure and one caused by a terrorist attack. However, Witt has a distinctly different view. He cites, as examples, terrorists simultaneously targeting roads and bridges to impede evacuation, attacks on responders, and spontaneous and shadow evacuation spurred by public panic. To be clear, the NRC recognizes the possibility of a radiological release, with or without terrorism, in as little as one to two hours. Yet while FEMA claims it takes fast-breaking scenarios into consideration, it fails to plan or drill for such scenarios. FEMA sidesteps those flaws that Witt identified as particularly serious, the congested road network and population densities around Indian Point both of which are fixed givens that cannot be altered. FEMA all but ignores emergency scenarios involving a spent fuel pool disaster. FEMA overlooks Witt's contention that a radioactive plume may travel well beyond the 10-mile EPZ. FEMA fails to comprehend the significance of the fact that many first responders, having little faith in the emergency plan, have admitted that, that rather than fulfilling their official duties, they will seek to protect their own families. Probably the most damning statement of all in FEMA's report is the agency's acknowledgement that studies associated with new reg 0654 clearly indicate that for all but a very limited set of conditions, evacuation, even evacuating under a plume, is much more effective than sheltering in place. Clearly, if you can't shelter, if you can't evacuate, you can't protect the people. So what has FEMA's response been to the overwhelming evidence that Indian Point's plan cannot meet our current needs? Finger pointing, bullying, and indecision. When counties declared that they could not, in good conscience, certify the plans were up to date, FEMA wrote a letter to the state instructing them to ignore the counties and certify the plans over county objections. When finally realizing it could not provide reasonable assurance that the plan works, FEMA arbitrarily tacked on a 75-day grace period to the 120 days the state is normally given to comply with certification requirements. 
We worry that all the buck passing and delays are being used by FEMA to give them time to figure out how to certify a patently unworkable plan. We agree with Mr. Witt that the plan should be improved. Certainly, if you make the improvements that he recommends in his report, that will help to address a minor uh, accident of the plant. But we also agree that the plans cannot be fixed to deal with the post-9-11 world. Chairman Chase, in conclusion, I urge you and the rest of the committee to pay close attention to FEMA and the NRC as this process unfolds. If I may, I would like to make, briefly make several spe specific recommendations to the committee. Regarding emergency planning, instruct FEMA to stop delaying and immediately withdraw its approval of Indian Point's emergency plan in light of overwhelming evidence and unanimous recognition by independent experts, elected officials, and the public that the major deficiencies in the plan cannot be repaired. In case the committee is not aware, and I think that uh, FEMA made reference to it earlier, or the NRC, FEMA has been faced with this issue in the past and acted appropriately. In the aftermath of Hurricane Andrew in 1992, FEMA not only temporarily withdrew its approval of, the Turkey, Point's, of Turkey Point's emergency plan, but ordered the Florida nuclear plant to shut down until reasonable assurance could be made that the plan would actually work. Given the terrorist threats and clear deficiencies with Indian Point's emergency plan, the situation in New York is clearly more serious. Uh, Congresswoman Kelly, I would encourage you, uh, recently uh, a, th a theory uh, was proposed uh, in Congresswoman Lowy and uh, Congressman Engel's uh, hearing last week that it might be the case that FEMA uh, and the local counties in reorganizing the emergency plan actually has essentially quarantined Westchester, whereas the evacuation routes used to go north into Putnam and east uh, into Connecticut and so forth, all the routes go south and away from the plant, but w are contained within Westchester. Uh, who knows what that means, but it's, an interesting, it's interesting that rather than sending people away to less populated areas, they're actually sending you down towards uh, more populated areas and, in fact, where the winds typically are blowing. Uh, regarding Indian Point security, introduce legislation that would Mr. require Mr. the Mr. energy finance Excuse hardening me. of on-site storage. Mr. If you could yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm winding up. I'm sorry. And Casper radiated spent fuel. Introduce legislation that would require energy finance federalization of military forces at Indian Point, and require that the force-on-force -force Osri test will be conducted at Indian Point. Test the actual ability to repel a sophisticated terrorist attack. And finally, recognize that perhaps Indian Point is a unique case, and the plant should be shut down. In, the, in 1979, in the wake of Three Mile Island accident, Robert Ryan, NRC, NRC's Director of the Office of State Programs, stated, I think it is insane to have a three-unit reactor on the Hudson River yeah, in Westchester County. Your time is up. We're going to okay. have to move on here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Lockbaum. Uh, good afternoon. On the behalf of the Uni Union of Concerned Scientists, it is my pleasure to appear before this subcommittee. My name is David Lockbaum. I have been UCS's nuclear safety engineer for the past six years. UCS has worked on nuclear plant safety issues for nearly 30 years. Nuclear plant security has been one of my top three focus areas since 1999. Our attention was drawn to this topic after the NRC discontinued its security tests in July of 1998. The security tests featured simulated attacks by mock intruders, sometimes as just a single person, against the facilities. The NRC began testing security in 1991. Approximately half of the tests conducted through July of 1998 revealed serious problems. Public outcry forced the NRC to re reinstate the testing later in 1998. From reinstatement through September of 2001, when the NRC once again discontinued the tests, approximately half of the tests revealed serious problems. While identified and fixed security problems are better than unidentified and uncorrected problems, we would prefer a declining failure rate indicating that the nuclear industry was taking security seriously and not waiting for the NRC to point out its shortfalls. On September 10, 2001, the NRC planned to test security at 14 nuclear plants in the upcoming year. All tests were canceled after 9-11. The NRC is just now reinstating a modified testing program at four plant sites. Since 9-11, the NRC has issued a series of orders requiring security upgrades. For example, access control requirements have been tightened. The NRC now wants background checks to be completed before workers roam freely inside nuclear power plants. That didn't used to be the case. 
The NRC plans two other orders. One proposed order covers security guard working hours. Nuclear plant owners responded to the security orders differently. Some, orders, some owners hired more guards. Other owners added few guards and just worked their existing guards longer hours. The Project on Government Oversight reported last September that some security guards were routinely working six 12-hour shifts in a row. When the NRC sampled security guard working hours last fall after that report, they found guards at seven plants working excessive hours. The proposed order will protect against human performance problems caused by fatigue by limiting the number of working hours. The NRC's other proposed order deals with training standards for security personnel. The proposed order will reportedly require security guards to demonstrate proficiency with their weapons more frequently and under more realistic conditions. These orders are essentially links in the security chain. Some orders strengthened existing links. Other Others added links to the chain, but any chain is only as strong as its weakest link. The testing program remains the best measure of that weakest link. The tests look for weak links and challenge them. The only thing worse than finding a weak link is not finding it. NRC administered security tests conducted at least once every three years provide Americans with their greatest protection against nuclear plant terrorism. Until all nuclear plants have been tested, no one can claim that terrorism threat is being adequately managed. Until then, we merely have good intentions. The NRC not only stopped security testing after 9-11, it also stopped meeting with public stakeholders on security matters. UCS and other public stakeholders fully accept that 9-11 forced rethinking of the information that can be openly discussed. But as today's hearing clearly demonstrates, there can be responsible public discussions of nuclear plant security issues. The NRC refuses to accept this reality. UCS has proposed a series of ways for the NRC to re-engage with public stakeholders in the post-9-11 world. The NRC's repeated refusals to interface with UCS and other public stakeholders is particularly troubling because the NRC does interface with other public stakeholders like the American Nuclear Society. It is abundantly clear that the NRC is hiding behind lame excuses only to avoid meeting with public stakeholders who might express criticisms, like our group. This is unfair and unacceptable. UCS would greatly appreciate it if this subcommittee would encourage, induce, or otherwise force the NRC to re-engage public stakeholders on security matters. The NRC's dismissal of contentions about security or about terrorism and sabotage from its licensing proceedings is based in part on its promises to upgrade security. The net effect of the agency's actions are to exclude the public from intervening on security issues in specific licensing cases and also to exclude the public from participating in generic safety discussions. As a minimum, the NRC must listen to security concerns from all interested public stakeholders so that the agency has the benefit of broad perspectives while they're making policy decisions. On behalf of UCS, I wish to thank the subcommittee for conducting this hearing on nuclear plant security and for considering our views on the matter. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank each of the panelists for participating uh, in this. And due to the large number of uh, participants in this panel, our first round of questions uh, will be uh, an amount of 10 minutes uh, to each uh, of the members of the, the subcommittee. Um, I, I want to thank our, our chairman, uh, Chairman Chase, for his efforts in putting this together. Uh, obviously, taken into context with previous hearings uh, that our chairman has had on the issue of the vulnerability of our, our nuclear facilities, the information that we have today is, is certainly very helpful in determining whether or not the threat assessment is actually being translated into action by the appropriate parties. And um, Mr. Slobodin, my first question is, is to you. In, in looking at, at your testimony and the written portion, uh, you say a most significant point is that an accident at Indian Point plants involving the release of large amounts of radioactive radioactivity is extremely unlikely, even in the event of a terrorist attack of the types we've seen on civilian and military targets worldwide. You then go on to, to talk about the reactor core itself and its, its protection. Uh, I know you're well aware that the testimony that this committee has received previously, and even the statements of our chairman today, 
have indicated that some of the areas of vulnerability that have been identified for your plant are not necessarily related to the core, and yet you continue to dismiss in your statement any vulnerability uh, or any likelihood of vulnerability um, of the facility. That, that raises a concern on, on my part, obviously, because when we look at the NRC or yourselves as, as operators, we would want a heightened level of concern and activity, not a dismissive level of, of interest. C could you please describe why you've come to the conclusion that, that it's uh, unlikely and that it's unlikely to have the impact that obviously others that have come before this committee describe as significant and real? I, I think that latter point is indeed the most important, important point. And what I'm saying here is that the nature of the radioactivity that is at a nuclear power plant, Indian Point and all other nuclear power plants, is well understood. It's finite. You can't add more to it than what is already there. An event that has a severe impact is one which releases substantial quantities of that radioactivity. In, from the nuclear core, we talk about an accident that melts the core. From a fuel pool, we talk about an accident that involves a fuel, fuel, fuel pool fire. The nature of those accidents is not different whether they are initiated by a mechanical problem or a terrorist, because the radioactivity, the issue at, con at concern, is the same. The response to those kind of events is a symptom-based response. That is, emergency planners measure the amount of radioactivity and they take action accordingly to decide protective actions. So when I say that events are not differentiated based on initiating event, that's what I mean. So in other words, if I could rephrase it, your emphasis is on a large release, not on the fact that a release would be likely. And your testimony doesn't really give us any information as to what you would find not to be a large release. Of concern to emergency planners, and of concern to public health are large releases. Small releases are not consequential to public health and safety. It takes a very large release of substantial quantities of radioactivity to have a major impact on public health and safety. Okay, well, major impact. I, now, <clears throat> again, this is an area I'm unfamiliar with, but it would seem to me that since your response planning is evacuation, that the concern level would be one of a release that rises to the level of a causing an evacuation? Our response plans deal from all the way from very minor to very major. In the most serious accident, evacuation <coughs> excuse me, may be an appropriate, probably is an appropriate response. A sheltering may also be an appropriate response. So we do not disregard in any way that that may be happening. And in fact, our plans, as you heard from uh, NRC, do take into consideration those kinds of, cons of events, ones in which there is a very large release of, of very massive quantities of radioactivity. That kind of event necessitates actions which may include evacuation, sheltering, movement of people. Okay, but well, let, me get, let me get back to, to what my point is. It, it seems to me that the whole point of doing the evaluation of the possibility of a terrorist attack on a nuclear facility, what actions need to be taken, and, and the ability of looking at the safety of the public, is to try to avoid its consequences. Your statement is that to, at this time, there is, there, it is unlikely that a terrorist attack to a facility would result in a release that would even result in an evacuation? Yes, because in order for a terrorist event to be successful, it would have to do the kind of damage that either melts the nuclear core or similarly the fuel in the spent fuel pool. To accomplish that is extremely difficult, even for a well-armed, sophisticated terrorist group. For example... No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well-armed, but your statement says the type of attacks that we have seen um, on, on civilian targets, which includes, of course, the World Trade Center attack. And again, there are people before you who have testified that, in fact, there is that risk. And I don't dismiss it, sir. The, an airplane, for example, of the type that was used at the World Trade Center, if it were used as a terrorist weapon, and it is the type which we have seen in the past, so I don't dismiss it, if it were to crash into the reactor containment building, 
studies have shown that that structure would resist that kind of crash. In the case of Indian Point, a f the fuel pools are similar structures with the exception of their roofs, but they are also largely below ground. So they're well protected as well by adjacent buildings and other structures, as well as their position from those kind of attacks, the, the airplane attack. Uh, so I don't dismiss it. In fact, I, we do indeed consider it. But your statement does appear to dismiss it. And it, it seems, again, that, that your level of concern is even less than the level of our chairman. Um, and uh, I would hope that if you had some greater sense of urgency, perhaps then we could look to you for recommendations or look to your organization for recommendations as to what might need to be done to better prepare or to better protect the public. Um, Ms. Howard, in your statements, uh, similarly, um, in the written portion, it says, the WIT report is fundamentally flawed. A and you, you cite in that two bases for its flaws. Uh, the first being that um, an assertion that uh, a terrorist-caused attack might be worse in magnitude uh, than that of merely an accident, and the second being that the issue of emergency management processes uh, would have uh, impacted by the consequences uh, of a terrorist-caused event. Both of those, as you've heard in the testimony today, are issues where if there is a terrorist attack, there is an assumption of intent on the part of the perpetrators that is different than the level that you would expect in an accident. That intent would be to cause the maximum amount of release, an accident having no intent, and also that perpetrators might have um, an ability or a plan to impact the, um, the processes by which you have your orderly planned and, and, and public uh, evacuation. But yet you dismiss those. Why? For the same reasons that we have test heard testimony earlier from the absolute radioactive inventory, the, con the cause of the event uh, does not create an additional release of radioactivity. We look into the massive release of radio radioactivity from an accident regardless of cause. As, as Mr. Slobodin has testified, you look at, look at what is the impact and then plan for that impact. Uh, as we continue to review uh, what we need to be doing to protect our national infrastructure and the critical infrastructures, if we should look and decide that we should look at resultant or subsequent um, impacts of some type of terrorist activity, that needs to be a combined effort between the Department of Homeland Security to look at how we protect our nation against enemies of the state. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Howard, I want to ask you about some of the advertisements. We're going to ask somebody to, to display them for us. That some of the advertisements that your organization ran in 2002, in, in the early part of 2002, they were in the roll call and the Hill and the, and the Washington Post down here. And uh, in those advertisements, just walked out the door, I think, heading over to those over there. Uh, they stated, and you'll see in a moment, that the guards were highly committed, well-trained, well-compensated professionals. Is that the industry's position? Yes, it is. Well, what about Mr. Lockbaum's testimony a little while ago and others from that we've heard from that tell us that many of these guys are forced to work 72 hours a week? Is that what the industry means by highly committed? No, we're, in those particular advertisements, we're talking about the individuals themselves and their training, and the training is very clear. As we have attempted to understand what the specific requirements are in the past, there has been some uh, excessive overtime in some individual facilities. That's being corrected. The other aspect is that as you have hired additional guards coming into the industry, we are in the process of training them to, to meet the competencies of the individuals that you see in these ads. And so the, the individuals that are protecting our nation's uh, nuclear plants are well-trained and well-compensated. Well, you know, just the power plant that's near uh, where I live in my district, uh, there's quite a substantial number of people working significant overtime on that. I, you're not trying to minimize and say that just a few of the 103 plants have people working uh, 72 hours or other excessive amounts of overtime, are you? The, as additional guards are trained and put on, the, on shift, that overtime will be coming down. What do we say about the fact that only one in four plants, the guides at only one in four plants, think that they can adequately protect their facility? 
Is, you know, that still seems to be the case in, in well, people that, that I've talked to. Well, with all respect, I believe that is an interview of, of some particular individuals. And there's some who have been hired who have not received all of the training. Uh, they have received training adequate for the positions they've been assigned, but may understandably want additional training. Well, Mr. Lockbaum, did, your group, the POGO, interviewed over 150 guys at about half of the plants. It, was it accurate to say that the information that you got from those interviews was that the, most of them, or uh, a significant number of them, didn't think that they were adequately prepared to uh, protect their plant? That was uh, the project on government oversight that did those surveys, and that, as I understand it, that was their, their finding. I, I think our view on that is I'm not discounting those surveys and those results, but mm -hmm. it's hard for an individual to gauge all the things that go together to form security. That's why we would like to see the testing resumed as quickly as possible, because that, that's really the proof in the pudding. If you pass the test, it doesn't really matter what the survey results were, high, low, or indifferent. You're demonstrating an adequate level. So we, we still think the security test is the key to, to having adequate security. Yeah. Um, any of Mrs. Lodian or Mr. Renz, Ms. Howard, uh, from any of you, I'd be curious to know, we have reports that the guards, other than, rather than being well compensated, are oftentimes not very well compensated. In fact, sometimes paid as much as $4 an hour less uh, than custodians. What's being done about that situation? Or do you dispute that? Or do uh, I have no knowledge of, of that specific example. Um, we, we believe that they are well compensated. We have seen in recent weeks uh, an increased demand in this type of individual that, that would uh, work that position, whether it's in other fields of security or, or law enforcement or what have you. Um, with respect, just a point of clarification from earlier, um, Overtime worked, you, you had a, a wave, a bow wave, if you will, after 9-11. You essentially went into uh, protecting the, whole, the entire site. Uh, you, you staffed uh, a high number of additional uh, positions. You secured the overall site, not just the protected area, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you then had NRC establishing new thresholds, new requirements. Uh, you then recognized you needed to be supplementing your guard force because you were working them overtime, too much overtime. Uh, you then started a hiring process. You then started a training process. And I believe that at this point in time, the, the numbers that were reflected last September of the overtime rates are, are not reflective today. You know, it's interesting what you're saying, but on those advertisements, they indicate that we were ready or we were prepared before September uh, 11th and we're prepared now. But what you're telling me is that you weren't prepared before September 11th because you've had to add on all of these additional precautions. Well, I'm telling you that, that we were prepared for a different standard before September 11th. Well, do you think that standard before September 11th included events uh, of the nature of terrorism or the events that happened on September 11th? It did, a absolutely. So there you was don't a believe that basis. any of these extra precautions by the NRC are, are necessary? Oh, I believe they're incredibly necessary. Uh, I don't, uh, that's not what I'm trying to communicate at all. Okay. Well, I guess I'm confused. If you thought that you were well protected before September 11th. We, we live you know, in a different environment. Why do you still think that you need to have all these additional standards done, Matt? Before September 11th, we met the existing design basis threat. Well, I understand that, but, but I just asked you whether or not you thought that was adequate to encompass the terrorism uh, activities as and we know things it, such as the nature of September 11th. I thought I heard you say you thought they were. No, as we know it today, no. Okay. Uh, right. If I might address the uh, matter of Indian point sure. uh, on your question of the compensation of security guards. I believe they're very well compensated. In fact, our guards are members of the Teamsters Union, and uh, I'm sure you could ask the Teamsters, uh, and they bargain well, and they're well compensated. As they should. Ms. Howard, is, is, what's your understanding industry-wide? What would you say is the um, standard of pay throughout the industry, the 101 plants? Uh, the standard of pay, I think, is, a, is quite uh, well compensated for this type of work. They are highly trained, and the compensation is added to that. Uh, these individuals, many of them are retired military. They've come out of the military and gone into to work for at our facilities, and therefore pay is, is commensurate with, with our military pay and the type of work that they're doing. Okay. Those advertisers also show us individuals in flak jackets and semi-automatic weapons. When those ads were run, uh, back right in the early part of 2002, how many of the plants require that those, uh, those items? I, I can't give you the specific, but Mr. Rance, who's in charge of security, may. <laughs> for, for Dominion, just a point of clarification. 
Um, actually, we were approached by the by the uh, the staff shortly after September 11th uh, to see if we would consider getting um, vests, light body armor, if you will, and uh, the company agreed to it, and we provided that. Um, I want to say uh, we ordered it within a couple of weeks, I believe, and and provided it as soon as it came in with with a number of several in in several weeks. Okay, and but Ms. Howe, you can't tell us industry wide on that. Uh, it varies. It certainly varies industry-wide, but the, we believe those ads are certainly representative at the time and certainly representative now. Thank you. My time, I'm told, is up, and I'm going to call on the good uh, spirits of my chairman here to let me ask one more question because I, I do have to leave. Uh, thank you. Yes. Mr. Mathiasen, you made a point um, that you talked about who's responsible for defending against the enemies of the United States when they might attack a nuclear reactor or like that. I'd like to just hear from left to right here who do we think should, share, should have that burden of defending these particular sites, and then who should bear the financial burden of that? Mr. Wells? Clearly, as I understand it, the Federal Government has a responsibility to define what that threat is going to be in terms of uh, what's going to be thrown at these plants, and then in turn the private industry and the licensees have to develop a strategy to figure out a way to counter that threat and hopefully to deliver something that will allow them to win. So it's certainly going to be a partnership. But your partnership encompasses the United States government setting the regulations or the standards and the industry bearing the burden of meeting them. That's correct, as we understand it. Thank you. Mr. Slobodian? We clearly have the burden to deal with the kind of threats which have been assigned to us by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and which will continue to be assigned to us. But threats that are national threats by large armies using sophisticated weapons in large numbers are what we call enemies of the state, and that is the responsibility of the federal government for defense of the nation. Where do you put terrorism in that equation? Terrorism, there's, a, there's obviously a point at which we have to defend, and we do defend against terrorist attacks of armed personnel in numbers that are uh, smaller than an army. Uh, and that actually is defined for us, and it's not something that we can talk about in a public session. However, a large military force with many weapons is something that is, uh, we, is defined for us as an enemy of the state and is the responsibility of the federal government for defense of the nation. Now, there seems to be a lot that the NRC and the industry don't want to talk about in a public forum. Is there some premise that you know, the public knowing about this is going to create a problem here? We, we live by a standard called safeguards. And it's in, the, it's in the regulations. So there are certain things about which we're not authorized to speak in public session. I think there's a willingness to talk about it in the appropriate forum. But in a public session, uh, we are prohibited from making such discussions of the details of our security programs. And there's uh, requirements worked out with the NRC and the industry? Well, the NRC establishes what, what safeguards means. And you heard Mr. Miller talk about sensitive information, and then he used the term safeguards. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the term in the civilian sector that we use for our classified information. Thank you. Mr. Renz? Uh, specifically with, with respect to uh, enemy of the state, I think uh, there is overlap and responsibility in, in repelling the design basis threat and responding or, or defending against an enemy of the state. Uh, clearly, 10 CFR stipulates that that's a federal responsibility, and I look forward to seeing how the, the federal government will evolve to, to respond or, or position themselves to take on that responsibility. Thank you. Ms. Howard? Yes, again, uh, the, it has to be a partnership between the industry and the responsible entities of government, be it local as well as the federal government, certainly from the enemy of the state that uh, should be a, a federal responsibility. We look forward to working with the Department of Homeland Defense as they assess vulnerabilities of all the critical infrastructure and at uh, some point use the standards that have been established in security as well as emergency preparedness in the nuclear industry over the past 20 years to start programs in other critical infrastructures. I just want to start. When you talk about enemies of the state, where do you put the terrorism factor into that? I certainly would, would put uh, terrorism uh, at the extent that we saw on 9-11 into the enemy of the state, as our president has. So you would think that that would not be the financial burden of the industry to have to protect its plant against that type of a, uh, an assault? 
It's the financial responsibility of the industry to meet the federal requirements of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on the design basis threat. And if the NRC then decided to raise the standards to mean that you had to meet threats of that nature, then you'd expect that the industry would have to live up to that and, and meet those. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mathieson? Yeah, I would say that uh, to, to suggest or to consider federalizing security at our nation's nuclear power plants would be a good step in the right direction. It would be a recognition that the current security forces and measures at these plants, in particular like uh, Indian, in Indian Point where there's high population densities, uh, would be a good start. I, too, agree, though, that not only should you federalize these forces, but I do think that the industry should pay at least some portion of the cost of doing that. That should be in included in the cost of doing business. Thank you. Mr. Lockbaum. For uh, attacks above the design basis threat level, that, that's the federal government's responsibility. And I guess we view the government's insurance of that responsibility by having the Department of Homeland Security run periodic exercises similar to the way FEMA conducts exercises in the emergency planning arena to make sure that the local, state, and federal authorities are all working together, because the federal response in Kansas is going to be different than the one in Seabrook, obviously due to the presence of Coast Guard and Navy, which the uh, Wolf Creek plant in Kansas wouldn't be involved. And I guess what my comments have been designed to say that design threat basis, I would assume, would be high enough so that the industry would realize that a possible threat would be something of the nature of terrorism and that they would be responsible to then deal with that. But I, I hear some people here suggesting that perhaps that the taxpayer ought to take the um, financial burden of that or some aspect of it, even though these are profitable uh, private entities. Well, up to the design basis, even if it's a terrorist threat, smaller people than the design basis threat level, we think that the plan owner needs to be able to repel that because they're not going to take a survey saying, are you a terrorist group or just a domestic disgruntled person? Right. They need to be able to defend against that. And above that, you know, their, their forces are there going to be protecting against, but the government needs to be responsible for protecting above that level. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for your testimony here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your uh, kindness and letting me exceed my limits. I thank all of excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, I thank all of you for waiting so long and uh, participating in this hearing. And um, I just I want to ask one or two questions you're going to say you may say this is kind of stupid, but maybe I'll agree with you at the end. But I want to size up a sense of where my this panel is coming from. I'm going to ask each of you uh, this question. I'll start with you, Mr. Lockbaum. Should we shut down all our nuclear plants? I don't. We don't believe so. We'll, uh, we'll lose some UCS members, but we don't believe so. Not for Mr. security Matheson. reasons. Mr. Matheson. No, as I said before, Riverkeeper is not an anti-nuclear group, and nor do we believe that every nuclear power plant in this uh, country should be shut down. We do think that those in uh, particularly high population density areas should be given special scrutiny. Okay, come back to Ms. Howard. No. Mr. Renz. Um, no, not at all. Mr. Slobodin. No. Mr. Wells. Mr. Chairman, we wouldn't have done a body of work to support that. Right. Um, so the bottom line is, I mean, this isn't an issue about how we're going to shut down all our plants. Even if, okay. The next question is, um, uh, with our, um, with the sites that we have, we have 104 commercial nu nuclear power plants operating 64 sites in 32 states. Uh, of those, um, are there any that you would shut down, and if so, how many? Mr. Lockbaum. I, I guess our the way we would see it is if, if you run the security test and don't do well on it, then the failure or the bad performance on the security test would warrant a shutdown until that security problem is fixed. So one, t one test would be those that the sh security tests don't measure up. Right. And your point to us was they haven't been doing these security tests. Right. Nobody knows one way or the other whether the security is adequate or not. That was pretty surprising to me, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lockbaum, because I would think after 9-11 we would have done a lot more rather than none or very few. It, it was a good idea at peacetime. You thought, well, we would have thought in heightened threat level that would have been a great idea, but it didn't happen. Okay. Mr. Matheson, uh, of these 130 plants, 100, excuse me, 104 plants and 64 sites, how many do you think need to be closed? Uh, I would personally argue uh, only one, only because I don't know 
any of the details about any of the other plants. Okay. I only know about Indian Point. I would say, though, that where you have an evacuation plan that just can't work, I think that Federal regulators have no choice but to shut down a plant. You need to have an operable evacuation plan. And you plan. would probably su suggest that you had mentioned urban areas. So have you done any studies of any other areas or just this? No, again, we're a local group. We okay. haven't. But I okay. imagine that Indian Point isn't the only plant located in a densely populated area. I know there's some around Chicago and other cities. Well, without going through any, uh, uh, just asking each of the four of you, is there any plant that you think uh, in the United States needs to be shut down? No, sir. No. When the plans meet the standards and federal regulations, their license conditions, and demonstrate so, then the answer is no. Okay. Mr. Wells? We have taken no position. Thank you. Mr. Slobodin, um, as it relates to Indian Point, um, you would agree that the um, evacuation plan is wanting somewhat or not? No, sir. I think it's, uh, it is, well, it, all plans, regardless of where they are, merit improvement. One of the things that's being done in the case of Indian Point is to substantially improve the information and that evacuation planning. So I agree with you that the plans need improvement, and indeed they are being improved. Mr. Matheson uh, was, um, was making the point that in densely populated areas you need to pay cl uh, closer attention and perhaps not um, uh, and, and not have a nuclear uh, power plant there. Uh, is there, um, is there logic, logic to his argument as you see it, um, Mr. Slobodin and Mr. Renz and Ms. Howard? There are a number of studies uh, by experts, including people such as Dr. Dennis Miletti of the University of Colorado, Dr. John Sorensen of the University of Oak Ridge Associated Universities who talk about these kinds of issues. And they point out some things that may be indeed counterintuitive. For example, in high population zones, there are typically a greater extent of infrastructure and response capability. They, actual, they also look at actual responses in such kind of environments. I think, therefore, that um, when one looks at the scientific literature on these uh, questions that you're posing, you see that it indeed it is possible to affect an, an evacuation even in an area uh, such as those around Indian Point. I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you why you think Indian Point represents a particular challenge. I'll tell you why I think it does. I'd be curious to know. Mr. Renz? I was just going to mention that I believe it's a site-by-site. -site, Could you put the uh, mic a little close to you, Mr. Renz? Okay, sure. Uh, I consider it a site-by-site -site evaluation as uh, actually Mr. Slobodin just said, that uh, you tend to have a higher level of, of public safety infrastructure for a higher level of, of uh, populace. Uh, that's been my experience at least. Okay. Ms. Howard? I think it's also important to note that uh, plants are built in the areas of high concentration for, in order to supply the electric load uh, from our planning and over the years of our planning and actual exercising and then using these plans in, in response to non-nuclear emergencies. We've seen that they can be effective and so I don't think that the high population density area is of, of, of a concern based on that as well as uh, what's previously been said about the infrastructure, transportation, highway infrastructure in high population areas. I, I would say, Mr. Slobodin, you, you used the word counterintuitive, which is a good way to, to, um, to say it, it, it would really strike me as counterintuitive and it's, it's almost put me at a loss of words here because it is so counterintuitive that um, it's hard to believe. Um, Mr. Matheson and Mr. Lockbaum, um, is there logic to, lo let me ask you this question and I'll have the others respond to it as well. Um, first off, I, I'm not aware of any nuclear plant that's been built in the last 20, 30 years. Is that, what, what's the last one? How many years ago? Someone tell me. They're, they're 23 done, years. Built and, and they're started in the last 20 years. None were actually uh, started construction. The last came online in the early 1990s. But theoretically, we could still have one built. I mean, there's no, uh, no absolute prohibition. It's just cost and other factors, just, and all the requirements and regulations make it unlikely, correct? Well, yes. Uh, there's much interest in building new nuclear plants, both on the part of uh, companies to supply additional electricity going forward, as well as on the part of the government in order to assure uh, an adequate supply of non-emitting 
uh, generation in this country and, and to energy security and energy diversity. So there are plans for uh, to, that we're putting together today. Well, and well, do, let me ask you this, um, Ms. Howard, first. Uh, given the current NRC siting guidelines, would the NRC license a plant to operate in a densely populated area? I think you would have to look at uh, the existing site, uh, there's ex extensive siting guidelines, but I think that uh, certainly that's taken into account. The population density is taken into account. It's a plus or a minus? It is. Um, By the NRC? It's part of a, a not number being of. Not it, being counterintuitive. <laughs> it's, it's part of a number of factors that are taken into account. As a plus or a minus? Uh, certainly a, as a. As a I don't consider it a minus. I think you have to consider no, it how I, you I make your design. You, I don't know what you consider, as, but did the NRC consider it something that they consider as a plus to have it in a uh, densely populated area, or do they consider it not a place they would recommend? A dense, I would say a densely populated area is, is not an area that would be looked favorably for, for siting of new plants. Okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Matheson, Mr. Lockbaum, do you want to jump in on any of this? Well, yeah, I would just say there's a reason why the NRC's new guidelines would never allow it to site a plant in Westchester County is precisely because of the population densities around the plant. And I do find it also counterintuitive to suggest that in more uh, sophisticated or, or, or larger metropolitan areas that the evacuation planning or safety emergency plan is going to be uh, better. That might be, in fact, the case, but it doesn't take away from the fact that you also have much more congested roads uh, and much more uh, dense populations. Mr. Lockbaum? I don't know anything in the NRC's regulations that would prohibit a siting a plant in a, de a densely populated area uh, from, a, from a pure regulation standpoint. I, I think to its credit, the NRC's regulations ensure that all people, even if they live in Kansas or my sister lives close to a plant in the south, and even though it's a, not a very heavily populated area, I want to make sure she's protected it just as well. And the NRC's rules don't distinguish. They don't say there's not enough of you for us to be concerned about. Um, right. in, around this plant, and that that would be applied no matter where anybody wanted to site a plant in the United States. They'd want to make sure that this, the plant met the appropriate regulations. I think the focus of this hearing is appropriate. Does FEMA and the NRC applying the right standards to ensure that protected, protective activities could take place if they were needed? That's, if that answer is yes, and we have reasonable assurance that that answer is yes, then it doesn't really matter where you site the plant. If we don't know the answer to that question with any certainty, then we need to put the plant out in the, in the boonies somewhere where we're harm, harming as few people as possible. So I guess that would be my long-winded answer to that question. Yeah, it just was, I was just thinking if I lived near this plant and I wanted an evacuation plan, I could probably go to my wife and finally justify why I should buy an expensive boat. <laughs> um, probably be the best way to just go upriver a bit. I. Um, I, I just want to, uh, I'll come to a conclusion here, Mr. Slobodin, but, but uh, tell me what, be, be the person who's going to be uh, candid about the challenges uh, dealing with a, an evacuation plan about, um, uh, Indian Point in particular, uh, since that happens to be the closest to where my constituents live. I'll start you out. Uh, if you're on the east side of the Hudson, you either have to go up to the Tappanzee Bridge down, I mean, get to the Tappanzee Bridge, go to the other bridge north of that, I guess, um, or um, head, head east. Uh, the problem that you head east is what? The, the concern, of course, is uh, understanding where you might be affected. And let me point out that uh, the predominant wind flow directions from around Indian Point are in the Hudson River Valley because of the topography of the valley. 95% uh, of the time, the wind flow is in the Hudson Valley regardless of the incident wind direction. So people from the east, people on the east and people on the west are at substantially less risk than you might think because of the prevailing weather conditions. The uh, but, but most of the population is east of the Hudson, correct? That is correct. And they, they're not going to likely go west. They're going to have to all go east, correct? 
I mean, isn't one of the challenges we have that people will be tripping over each other in their effort to get out? I think the presumption, perhaps, that they're operating under is that, and you should tell me, is that all people within the area would have to evacuate. We believe, based on the, the, the physics of plumes, that the people who would be affected are really very few uh, because of the nature of the plumes. And if one understands plumes, and this gets back to my point earlier made in my testimony about the need for education and public outreach, when that is clearly understood, and when you realize that a plume is like the smoke from a smokestack, it's not different in terms of its shape and size, you may have some confidence about the actions that you can take. It's only when you believe that the whole area is going to be instantaneously or very rapidly affected that you believe that you have to evacuate those large areas. Such is not the case. So for us, for me in particular, education is critical in this matter. When we understand the hazard, when we understand the nature of the risk, we're better able to deal with it. Uh, and I think that, uh, in the, so in the example that you point, people living to the east, it's very unlikely that they would have to move at all to avoid the risk. They might choose to move because they would be concerned, but they would not have to. Um, Mr. Wells, in your um, highlights, you point out in 2001, GAO reported that over the years, NRC has ad had identified a number of emergency preparedness weaknesses at any point, too, that had gone largely uncorrected. And then in the next paragraph, it says, since GAO two's, GAO's two 2001 report, NRC has found that emergency prepare, uh, preparedness weaknesses have continued. So what am I to conclude from those two statements? You have to have a lot of patience because these problems have been identified many times as early as 1996. They're still being corrected. Some of them are falling off. Some of them are being fixed. Some of the new, some new problems are being found, which is probably a good thing, but of concern is the continuing uh, problems that have been identified over and over again that still seem to don't have a total fix yet. That's of concern. Okay. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with Mr. Bond's answer, no. Uh, did he, had he seen the plan, did he know what uh, he and his constituency was supposed to do? And the answer was no. Now, I want each of you to react to that and tell me what that means. Mr. Wells, we'll start with you. Is there advantage to going first? Um, one, were you surprised? No, one would not be surprised. Yeah. However, I think the, as I pointed out in my statement, finding problems is probably a good thing because it forces attention to be paid to fix things and get things moving toward a more positive uh, direction. Mr. Slobodin? Given where he lives in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'm not surprised. He's far from the Indian Point plant. He's far from the Millstone plants, which are in Connecticut. His risk, therefore, is extremely low. And uh, while in the case of Indian Point, he lives within 50 miles, that emergency planning zone mm -hmm. is not sized for the purpose of dealing with acute threats. Okay, I'm going to react to what you just said, since I happen to be very familiar with the area. It's 24 miles away. Um, and the plan uh, is directing people right through his community. I, I'm not, the plan for uh, Indian Point? Yeah. I, I'm not aware that that's the case. I think it's directing them in, in, uh, to the uh, southeast. Southeast. Uh, how much further southeast can you go? It, well, is, is he in New Canaan, Connecticut? Correct. So I think the plan is actually directing people to the south of him, south and east of him. Okay. Not into got, Connecticut. No, no, this, this, oh, not into Connecticut at all? The, the uh, Indian Point, the plans established by, um, in this case, it's Westchester County and Putnam County. Right. Um, would have people moving to out into uh, eastern Putnam County and southeastern Westchester County. Okay, and then where do they go? At that, then they go where they choose. Mr. Slobodin, you had me with you. I'm thinking, you know, you're a sharp guy, but all of a sudden I'm beginning to wonder. I mean, good grief. Where, where do they go after that? Well, sir, they don't have to go beyond that point to be out of harm's and you, way. And you really believe that they're going to just say, oh, the experts have told me that if I'm 30 miles away, I'm just fine. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that's what's going to happen? If, we do, if I do my job correctly, 
and get information to the public. And if the NRC and FEMA and others do the same, then the public will have a better understanding of what the hazard is and will act appropriately. Today, they may be frightened and act inappropriately. So it's your testimony before this committee under oath that no one in Connecticut needs to leave any, anywhere. From, we're, we're, from, uh, from any a serious uh, d destruction of, of Indian Point uh, does not require anyone from Connecticut to leave. I think it would be exceedingly unlikely that anyone, Connecticut, anyone living in Connecticut would have to take an action as a result of an accident at Indian Point to avoid acute health risk. I was so ready to leave this panel and get on with life here, but <laughs> is that your view, Mr. Renz? Um, I, I, I think you're asking a site-specific question with respect to Indian Point that I'm not yeah, but, familiar but, but, with. But, you know, I'm asking if a selectman it, it's a community 24 miles away from, from a major nuclear power plant. Sure. And I've just described to you a scenario that um, this plant has been destroyed. And, and I'm, I'm hearing an expert say folks in Connecticut 24 miles away don't need to be concerned. I, th I think everybody needs to be concerned. I don't know that um, based on your definition of, of destroyed, your, your, your worst case design basis accidents would not have, you have any concern at 24 miles from, a, from an acute exposure standpoint. There would be, as I understand it, no need for protective actions. It's very important for you both to put this on the record, because um, this will be, uh, we'll probably have uh, another hearing just on this whole issue, because this fascinates me. Ms. Howard? I mean, and this is what you believe, and you may be right. Uh, uh, you're the experts, right? Uh, and, and, but it, 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 my, my view is, from everything I've learned, it, it's hard for me to, to put what you're saying in the context of what I've learned. Ms. Howard? May I, may I offer yes. a suggestion? Sure. Uh, there are documents that describe some of these consequences. Uh, scientific documents such as uh, New Reg 0396, which describes the consequences from a very large release of very serious accident at a nuclear power plant. And it talks about the radiation exposures and the, the dose consequences and the health effects. Mm -hmm. And it was, in fact, one of the documents that was used to define the size of the emergency planning zone. And so when I think of something like Chernobyl, I'm just thinking of something totally unrealistic, nothing like that, whatever. That's you're going to be your, your view. Ms. Howard, I'm going to get down to the other gentleman here. Yes. Well, certainly let me comment on your comment on Chernobyl. No, don't, not yet. Do the other one first, and then we'll do <laughs> Chernobyl. Uh, I, again, as uh, uh, Mr. Slobodin has mentioned, there's a scientific basis for the inventory that could be released, the emergency planning area where evacuation or some type of protective action should take place is deemed less than 10 miles. We've kept it at the 10 miles. The 50 mile is from a standpoint of looking at over time and monitoring of any dis disposition of uh, radioactive isotopes from a standpoint of food or water supply. Do you agree with what, what Mr. Renz and Mr. Slobodin have said? Yes, that, I do. Uh, that you, you, basically the only thing you have to be concerned with is, is what's in the 10 miles and 24 miles away, you don't have a problem. I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth here because this is, point, this point, is heavy point stuff. Clarif point of clarification. Um, the, the, one of the assumptions that lays the basis for the 10 miles is that if you plan out to 10 miles, you have uh, an established infrastructure that you can expand upon should the need arise on an ad hoc basis. So that the, the planning, the, yeah, the but assumptions but do but not... But Mr. Bond doesn't need to know about that because he's 24 miles away. Um, he would be advised on an ad hoc basis at the time. I mean, it is, it is so unlikely that you would have a protective action outside of, anywhere outside of 10 miles. Yeah, and it's so unlikely that people from that area wouldn't come to, uh, to, um, to New Cana, which is, I'm being facetious now. That's a function of public information, public education. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's a function of public reaction to exactly. a disaster. Exactly. And you and I know that the public is not going to sit by because two experts came to a panel and said you don't need to be aware, afraid. That, you know, and, I don't, and, and, and if, you, if, if, if we should be saying to people, they don't need to be concerned unless you're 10 miles or in, uh, I just want to make sure that, that I'm not practicing bad medicine. Mr. Matheson? 
Yeah, I think it's important to note that a few of the other panelists have made reference uh, a couple times to acute exposure. And I know that Mr. Slobodin in uh, the newspaper uh, around our area in Westchester uh, was quoted as admitting that the evacuation plans for Indian Point really are designed to protect against acute uh, illness, i.e., uh, shorter term illnesses and, and perhaps death within a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Um, and in fact, the NRC's own studies as recently as a year or two ago. Uh, cited the effect of a radiation dispersal event as a result of a spent fuel fire. And they said that you would have tens of thousands, uh, potentially tens of thousands of long-term uh, cancer-related deaths as far away as 500 miles, uh, up to 500 miles away from a nuclear power plant. So I think that that does fly in the face of, of what uh, uh, these folks are telling us. Um, I also, just to, to mention about the wind direction, I think that Mr. Slobodin is right that at the lower altitudes, the wind does tend to go north or south up and down the Hudson Valley, but at the higher altitudes, it tends to go west to east, uh, and therefore, in most cases, uh, head towards Connecticut, sometimes a little north, sometimes a little south. Mr. Lockbaum? Well, I guess I'm a little bit skeptical, uh, particularly at, at the same time. Skeptical? I'm uh, skeptical of what? The, uh, the energy claim that uh, only people with living within 10 miles would have to uh, take any action for their protection. I, I think if that were, if there were a strong basis in fact for that, the industry and the NRC wouldn't be, for the, be before the Congress asking for renewal of the Price-Anderson Act. You know, until the industry is willing to back up its words with its money instead of my money, I'm going to remain a little bit skeptical of such claims. Refresh me, Price-Anderson Act. Mm. Price-Anderson provides federal liability protection mm. in case of a nuclear power plant accident outside the fences. Um, and no, that, but you, you, you know that sometimes people sue even when they don't have a right to, so you understand that, you know, well, the, the, neat thing, to, the neat thing about Price-Anderson is you don't have to establish fault. You just have to show damage. Right. Um, so it, it okay. alleviates some of the, the high burden of uh, I, I, typical I, lawsuits. Okay. Well, um, I, now, why don't you tell me about Chernobyl? I, I was in Norway and meeting with scientists, uh, telling me that they were actually getting particles, radioactive particles, that, they, that uh, were the result of Chernobyl. So, tell me about that. Well, well, sir, the the design of the Chernobyl facility uh, did not have containment. It also was a graphite um, moderated yeah. core, and therefore, uh, because of the heat that occurred there. Uh, it caught fire, and you had right. an aerosol effect without any containment. Uh, yeah, just a I understand that part of it. I mean, in other words, and you there's there but, were but it wasn't 10 miles. Well, again, you would not have uh, those types of uh, reactors anywhere outside of right. the uh, former Soviet Union, so, so and you, they have been changed significantly. Right, but I mean, I'm really out of my territory here. But we are putting something on the record. Um, and, and what I want to be clear is, um, is it your testimony that because of the type of fuel we use that we only have to be concerned 10 miles? Or is it your uh, testimony that because of the way we, we isolate the fuel uh, that we only have to be concerned 10 miles? It's a combination of uh, the type of design of the facility, uh, the use of containment, uh, so there were many factors that led to that being an in inherently unsafe uh, situation, along with the uh, test that caused the reactor. So that overrode safety systems. And so there are multitudes of differences. And you would never have the type of uh, reactor that the Chernobyl type of reactor is licensed in the western part of the world. Let me, um, Mr. Chairman, if I could just put on the record uh, my view of, of what I've heard. and, and and say that you know I, I know we will follow up. I I am, my I'm surprised that we have never. It's appeared we've never um, temporarily shut down a plant because of a question about an evacuation plan. It, it would strike me in the history of our um, of our experience with um, nuclear energy and with. Uh, the various sites around the country that there would have been some plan that wasn't adequate that would have required us to temporarily shut down. So that's one thing that surprised me. Another thing that surprised me is that that uh, with the experts today that um, 
from the NRC that they would uh, basically think that because they've tried to, to anticipate any type of, of, of disaster that uh, even though they didn't anticipate September 11th and what terrorists could do, that if it's a, a shutdown, it doesn't matter if it's a terrorist, if there's a, a breakdown, it doesn't matter if it's a terrorist or not, it's the same thing. And I'm struck by the fact that that's absurd. Um, I am surprised by the industry suggesting that, that one, that we only have to be con concerned 10 miles, and, and that may be true, uh, but that uh, I, I believe that if you're anywhere near that plant, you're leaving. And I will tell you this, uh, if I had a child or my wife and I were uh, in New Canaan and there was a problem at that plant, I'd be leaving New Canaan faster than you could imagine. And I wouldn't depend on, on the three of your testimony to make me feel good about it. And maybe that's a weakness on my part. But if I would do that, I bet there are a lot of other people who would. And for um, Mr. Bond not to be uh, told about a, a plan and for us in the state of Connecticut not to have a contingency plan, to me, is, is uh, pretty alarming. So, um, you know, I have a lot more questions than I have answers, but, you know, I guess questions are a good way to to start this dialogue. I have, I have supported nuclear energy. I do support it. I do think, though, we need to uh, uh, have some light year improvement on how we protect these facilities. I am concerned not what's under the hardened area, the reactor. I'm concerned with the, the brains, and the brains aren't under the hardened area. And it strikes me that if the brains mean something, if they're not working right, bad things happen. And um, so uh, this will be something that we're going to pursue, and I do appreciate the patience of all of you. Uh, you're experts, and, and I don't pretend to be, but um, um, there's just something that tells me this, there's something wrong here, and I'd like to get a handle on it. Mr. Wells, and I'm going to allow each, allow each of you to close, close up here. Mr. Wells, any closing comment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Congress passed the uh, Government Performance Excuse Results Act. Excuse me, with your Act. permission, Mr. Chairman, I'm like taking over. <laughs> Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I'm in the wrong chair to do this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would it be all right if the uh, gentleman just closed up? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Congress passed the Government Performance Results Act, which it challenged the federal agencies to establish goals in which they could be measured against for performance. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, among one of the federal agencies, has four goals. One of those four goals is public confidence. Um, as demonstrated today in the hearing and all the audit work that's been done over time, we look forward to working with the Congress to help the NRC uh, increase and improve its public confidence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, as we've heard today, this is obviously a very difficult topic. And that leads us, leads me to believe that among the two most important things that we in this nation can do are improve the education and base it on sound science. And I think that uh, those are missions for all of us to take on. Uh, and we at Entergy certainly intend and are doing that wholeheartedly. Thank you, sir. I, too, would like to thank you. Um, with respect to, to uh, public information, the nuclear industry, in my opinion, for 20 years, for over 20 years, has been an open book trying to provide public education um, in different venues. And uh, I think you saw it here today, difficulty with sharing information due to restricted information concerns, sensitive information, safeguard information. Uh, I think we do have a challenge before us, and that is to be able to effectively educate and inform the public moving forward and, and maintaining a high level of security at the stations. I would uh, add one point of clarification to one of the remarks you made, and that was um, with respect to uh, NRC never shutting down a, a plant temporarily due to emergency planning. I think Turkey Point was the example raised earlier today. And I do know of a number, or at least two sites, that were delayed in their initial licensing due to questions regarding the effectiveness of the emergency response plans. And I thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, thank you for putting that on the record. Again, I, I thank the committee and uh, look forward to a continuing dialogue because, just as we've all said, the uh, communication with the public needs to be two-way, and we need to continue to, to foster 
a good open sharing of information, and we look forward to coming back to the committee to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just say in summary that I'm concerned that everything that seems so obvious in terms of the problems of security and evacuation planning at Indian Point uh, are not apparently as obvious to FEMA and the NRC. Uh, there are over 270 elected officials in New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey who very much want to see this plant close, as well as a majority of the local residents in the surrounding area. I do, again, see Indian Point as a special case. And if there's ever a case for the NRC for the first time in its 30-year history or 40-year history to initiate uh, the shutdown of a nuclear reactor, I think that this is certainly it. And I appreciate very much your support on this issue, and I encourage this committee and others in Congress to continue to scrutinize the NRC and FEMA as we go forward in this Indian Point process. Let me just state, uh, I've asked for a temporary sus uh, a suspension until the plan is adopted. You know, I, I understand that. We appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to thank this subcommittee also for holding this hearing and inviting us to participate. It's my understanding of the Turkey Point event that it was FEMA that kept the plant shut down. The NRC thought that it was okay to restart without the emergency plan. So I, Turkey Point was the plant, but the NRC wasn't the white hat in that one. It was FEMA, at least my understanding of that event. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank you for pursuing this issue. Obviously, this is one that goes to the issue of public confidence, and I think there are s some serious issues that are raised that, that need to continue to be flushed out so we don't have uh, the possibility of them being, of important issues being dismissed and look at real ways to address them. So I, I want to congratulate you on, on your efforts to continue to pursue this. With that, we'll be adjourned. Thank you. programming update. Next, the Israeli ambassador to the U.S. talks about a possible war with Iran.